Welcome to the Open Apple Podcast, where we celebrate the Apple II. Whether you're a long-time user, a nostalgic visitor, or a newcomer to the community, join us as we share news and memories of Steve Wozniak's most famous personal computer. Hello and welcome to Open Apple. This is episode 49 for July 2010. This is your co-host number one, Quinn Dunkey, and with me as always is co-host number two, Mike McGinnis. How you doing, Mike? At your service, Quinn. How are you? Oh, I'm excellent. It's always good to hear your voice on the other end of this microphone. <laughs> you uh, too. I, I have a minor beef to pick with you, Mr. McGinnis. Oh, uh, oh no. Just, just yeah. a minor one this time? Yeah, I know. We haven't even <laughs> made it through the intro yet. I'm already picking on you. <laughs> I just listened to the latest episode of Drop Three Inches, and you stole my cold open for your uh, intro with uh, Paul Hegstrom there. I did? I, I don't... What yeah. did I do? Yeah, you did my co-host number one and co-host number two thing. Oh, yeah. It's just so easy and convenient, and you're so much smarter than I am. It's easy to just take it and use it. All right. Well, you've deflected me with flattery, and I will take it. See how good I am at that. <laughs> so, of course, the news of the hour is uh, Kansas Fest, uh, which is mm. very nearly upon us as we record Three this. Weeks. It is, yes, mere days or weeks away. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I will be there with bells on, uh, not literally. Well, I guess I'll have my Apple IIc, which has a bell, so <laughs> I'll, I'll be there with, with bell. Are you going hand. to wear it around your neck uh, or something? I, I might. It would be a little okay. heavy, but okay. uh, you never know. All right, uh, and I guess we should uh, probably explain a little bit about our, uh, our recording schedule here. Our June episode ran a little bit long. We had some difficulty finding free time both of us have new jobs and that always makes uh, the show here a challenge but uh, we thank our listeners for their patience with that uh, of course by the time you hear this the show is already out and who knows maybe this one's late and you don't uh, have any <laughs> idea what's going on but we like to talk as though this is live so there you go uh, but the good news is if you have a, a, a commute to kansas fest uh, to kansas city you'll have plenty to listen to on the way there that you will you will have more open apple than you know what to do with there is, such, there is such a thing as too much of a mediocre thing. So uh, all those listeners who asked for longer shows, careful what you wish for. Mm, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let's, let's uh, get on with the, the interviewing and stuff. Let's do that. Hi, I'm Randy Wigginton, and welcome to the Open Apple Podcast. Okay, tonight uh, we have with us one Lane Nooney, who uh, you probably know her the way that I know her, uh, or know of her, I suppose, uh, from her Atlantic.com article on, yes, Soft Porn Adventure, the game that uh, every young male Apple II owner pretended not to have and did. Hello, Lane, how are you? I'm well, and that's uh, quite a claim to fame for me to have. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for joining us tonight. I uh, I got to say that was that was quite an article, and and it inspired me to to go and and dig up uh, all a lot more of your writing. You got a, a lot of really great videos on YouTube about the history of gaming and going back, especially to my favorite era, the eight bit computer home computer era. I, I do have to wonder though. I've, I've seen your videos, and and you look maybe a little bit younger than say the typical demographic for most Apple II fans. <laughs> Yeah, in this kind of context, uh, talking with you, I feel like a, um, uh, you know, a, a, a true noob, I guess. <laughs> or, 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 or maybe I don't quite have the cred um, to be saying the things I do. That's right. So I'll, I'll say it on air. I'm 33. Okay. I That's did not, not... Yeah, so I was born in 82, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the Apple II era was not something that I participated in my youth or even when I got a bit older. Um, I kind of, you know, I think my first computer was a Tandy, maybe in 1990. Ooh. And <laughs> hey, it could did what worse. it needed it to do, you know. That's right. That's right. It ran, it, you know, it ran King's Quest One, And uh, uh, yeah, so I, I think I'm an interesting um, kind of interlocutor uh, in this history because I come to it without having any actual personal memory of it. Well, that's actually some of our favorite guests because it's always interesting to see <laughs> how sort of people that weren't there at the time, you know, view this stuff and react to this stuff. I mean, for us, you know, it's it's 90% nostalgia and 10% and rationalizations for nostalgia. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, I really like talking to people who, who weren't there and have a fresh, have fresh eyes on this. Uh, so yeah, I mean, soft porn, you know, is a bit of a legend in the Apple II community, and uh, if I, if I think it was probably our first uh, game for our uh, weird gaming segment here on the show. Uh, if not, it was certainly in the early uh, episodes of that. 
but your uh, column here has a really sort of fresh take on this, uh, the bizarre phenomenon of this game. And I really love the uh, original slides that you've got in the article, sort of uh, behind the scenes photos kind of thing. Can you talk about those and how you came across them and so on? Oh yeah, that, that, was, a, that was like a wonderful, weird discovery. So, so I went, so, so, last, so two years ago, I took a trip out to Oakhurst, California. I was, um, I, I thought at the time I was merely writing a chapter of my dissertation on Sierra Online. And it, it turned out that Sierra Online became the subject of my entire dissertation. But there were, I had been reading uh, some, I had been reading issues of the Sierra Star on microfilm uh, at, um, at my home university, which was Stony Brook University out on Long Island. And there were a couple of reels that were missing. And I knew from dates in Soft Talk magazine that it was very likely that these were the reels in which the soft porn ad had been reprinted in the Sierra Star. The Sierra Star was the local magazine out of running out of Oakhurst, California at the time. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to check out while I was in Oakhurst was the local library. And so I showed up at this very, very small rural library and, you know, asked for microfilm of their town paper from like 1981. Um, and, you know, they fished it out of some, some weird, uh, very dusty file cabinet and handed it over to me. And their microfilm machine didn't even work. <laughs> uh, I was I was spooling it by hand, um, and I I remember the moment when I turned it and I saw the so so because that ad ran in Time magazine um, that was a big deal to a town of just you know a couple thousand people in 1981. So because it got them so much national acclaim, uh, they reprinted the ad in the in the actual town paper and they listed <laughs> they listed the names of everyone in it which is how I knew who all the participants were. And, and, and so I think I'm also one of the few people who's ever, who's ever dug up the names of everyone there. But it, it also included the name of the photographer. Um, they, they actually sourced it because it was shot by someone in the town. And there was a credit on it that said, photo by Brian Wilkinson. And I sat there for a minute and I was like, this name sounds really familiar. And I went back through some notes I'd taken the day before. And someone said, had, at the Historical Society had said, you should go talk to the editor of the town paper, Brian Wilkinson. And I was like, wait a minute, right? Like this, like, it was like a, a giant cartoon light bulb went off in my head. And so I, I pulled up the Sierra Stars website on Google and I realized this has to be the same guy. Um, you'll note in, I think whichever issue of Soft Talk did, um, the, the Soft Talk exec cover story, or uh, cover story on Sierra, on, or I guess at the time online systems. Um, Brian also took the headshots of Ken and Roberta that are in that issue. That was something I, I, I figured out later. So I sent him an email and asked him kind of, I was like, you know, I know this is a weird question, uh, but did, did you happen to take a, th this, this advertising photograph, <laughs> uh, for, for this ad? And it was so, Brian was such a nice guy. He wrote back and he was both like really entertained and like really embarrassed that, <laughs> that, that especially like this, you know, like young woman had found him, which was, I think what he, you know, how, how he kind of like related to me. Um, and so I showed up at his, I showed up at his office. We had a little conversation about how the photo shoot had actually happened, how he knew Ken. Um, and then some, a year later, I emailed him to uh, just confirm some quotes I had gotten from him during that little talk. And he said, oh, by the way, I was cleaning out a desk and I found some slides from that photo shoot. Do you want me to send them to you? And I was just like, oh, my God, yes. Like, what are you? Are you I, I mean, this is um, uh, this is unreal. And yes, of course. And he said actually sent me four. Only two could be published in the Atlantic article because the other two were uh, I'll simply say one was a shot from the balcony. So it was overhead. Um, and into a hot tub. So it was, um, yeah, yeah, you can, you can figure it yeah. out, right? It was, it was, it was fairly revealing. And I was like, I don't, I don't feel like I'm absolutely not putting this into something that could circulate online. Um, I don't actually know anyone in this photo besides, you know, I mean, and I don't know Roberta Williams at all. Um, yeah. So, and then the other one, I think also had some, some questionable, um, you know, 
breast exposure. So th those were edited out of the public version, but I had these really, this really perfect little stream of um, the original, and even the slides themselves, because they had uh, the slide, the slide itself could tell me what kind of film it was shot on. It could tell me what order they were shot on, more or less. Um, I can, I could actually pair them up and figure out like kind of what was happening as like you could watch the sky darken. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So I was able to, I, I can put together like a really thin sort of, um, little temporal narrative about the order in which the shots were taken. Not all of them include the Apple II in the background. Um, and actually, so the funny thing is, I also visited the house that that photo was taken at uh, while I was in Oakhurst. That was one of one of the other things I did while I was out there. So you said, uh, as, as you were talking there, I, I heard you said you don't actually know Roberta. Does that mean, because I know you've spent a lot of time talking face-to-face -face with employees of Sierra Online and, 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 um, and also Broder, but we'll get to that in a minute. But did you not talk to Kenner or Roberta? So I've, at this moment, I think I've interviewed about 30 ex-employees. I have had some, I have had a phone call with Ken because um, the, the, the first chapter of the dissertation really focused on Mystery House. And, and the more I dug into the secondary and primary literature, I realized like there's a lot of questions no one's ever asked Ken about how this game got made. Uh, so I've talked with him some. A lot of my strategy in trying to write a history of Sierra Online is actually to defer the priority of the designers and the owners in favor of, let's say, people who worked in the factory or people who worked in quality assurance, uh, people who worked in marketing, uh, I managed to track down their, their chief financial, op financial officer. Um, I, in a lot of ways, I'm really trying to put together a labor history of this company. And I think that the, in a lot of ways, you know, the fa like, um, fans and enthusiasts and citizen historians have done a lot of work in terms of, um, tracking down a lot of the really identifiable figures associated with these games. And I think that there's an equally, like, elegant and quieter history, uh, wrapped up around other, other folks. And, and the great thing is these people haven't ever told stories about themselves, so you get a very different kind of interview process with them. Now, having talked to all of these people, what sort of picture of Sierra is, has emerged for you? Oh, I mean, that's such a wonderfully complex question. Uh, it's one that I have to break down kind of into periods, because really, I mean, the company's history is, is you know, sort of 20 plus years. And then the great thing about writing the history at this moment is it's also gone through this weird resurgence where, right, they're making like King's Quest Nine. Right, I mean, you, yeah. you, could, you couldn't have asked for a better unintentional epilogue to a dissertation mm -hmm. than, to, <laughs> than to be writing a history and suddenly have to explain to your committee, well, you know, there's actually a major entertainment conglomerate that owns the rights to, the, to all of this <laughs> IP and, and that has just, just decided to bring this back to life. I, I think that I'm... I think one of the things I spent a lot of time focusing on is just understanding how this company functioned. Um, what we don't really have, and what even someone like Ken Williams couldn't really explain if asked, I think, you know, is like, how did, how did just this, this company run, right? At the point at which you have all of these different layers of management that have to kind of operate, right? They're, they're overseen, but they're all kind of operating somewhat independently. Um, and then, you know, I've been surprised by things like the effect that the IPO had on the company. Um, a lot of people, a lot of fans, I think, track the demise of Sierra Online to the move in Bellevue. But the more I talk to employees, they they would trace kind of these major sh shifts in kind of the tone of company management actually happening once they have to produce quarterly profit, right? And so, so stuff like that that is less about the games in some ways. Um, actually becomes a larger part of the story that I'm trying to figure out. And that's really interesting that you're kind of exploring it from other angles, you know, the, the lower and middle level employees, the financial side of it. Uh, as you said, you know, that I think the stories of, of, you know, Ken and, and Roberta, the low hanging fruit has really been, been told a, a lot. And so, you know, like we recently we had Jason Scott on the show and he talks mm. about uh, sort of first tier and second tier and third tier histories where, you know, everybody knows the big stories, the easy stories. Uh, but where things really get interesting is when you get down into those lo lower levels and you sort of see how organizations like this are these sort of sums of their many very messy parts. And uh, you get a much more nuanced understanding, perhaps, of how these places operated. 
Yeah, that's that's a really lovely way of putting it. Um, so, for example, you know, there was a conversation I had with a woman who uh, did a, had a kind of um, kind of mid range administrative job in in the on the factory floor, and she was trying to explain to me that that when she got hired in the mid '80s, she was like, you know, the idea of a of a kit list didn't exist, and I was like, well, what are you what are you talking about, right? What's that? I spent a lot of time doing, can you just explain in the plainest language possible, like what you're talking about? Um, and she's like, you know, a sheet of paper that told you everything that went in the box. And I was like, no one had made a list before. And she's like, no, we invented that. Right. Like, 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 or, you know, I invent, like I had the idea that we will make a list and everything will have a serial number and that way we can track inventory. And, uh, you know, except we didn't keep inventory on plastic wrap because that got too complicated. I mean, you get these like very, um, you, you realize all the different ways that this company had a very kind of historical impact that, that is, is really just not even just about the games that they produced, but the video game and the computer industry as a business. Um, and, and all of those, I think, kind of, I think, rollout effects that wound up happening uh, as, as the company had to keep morphing over the span of 20 years. I think of Sierra Online as a really ideal case because it, it lasted kind of the span of the home computer. As a as a as a stationary object, you know, it it, it starts in 1980. It you know, it really sort of folds up around the early 2000s. and um, has a really major history that happens before computers get networked. Um, even though it's also wrapped up, it right, it, it has this like weird tendril of its history where it produces the first online graphical gaming network. I mean, it's like every transition the video game industry went through, Sierra went through. Um, and there's not many companies where you could both say that and still have it be the case that the people who participate in it are locatable. Yeah, that's interesting. I never thought about it that way. But yeah, Sierra Online really was a, a microcosm of the microcomputer revolution. Yeah, I think it, I think it tells, um, it, it has a lot to do with uh, the, the regional, I've, I've, it's in this, in this story, I've, I've begun to realize how important the the regional aspect is, right? The fact, it's the fact that it was isolated that actually has allowed me to be able to go back and find these people. If I were dealing with a company that, you know, ran out of the Bay Area or out of Silicon Valley, the problem is those employees, they splinter, right? They don't have to stay at this job. They go and they take any number of jobs anywhere else and they, they get, they disperse. Um, what happened in Oakhurst was that, like, there's a good body of people who, when that company left, those people stayed. And that means you can like drop in and still talk to many of them because they're still alive. You know, something uh, else I'm curious to see your perspective on this. A lot of these companies, uh, you know, they were in a brand new industry that nobody knew if there was going to be any money in it. And a lot of them came, you know, right out of school or right out of other uh, types of work. And so, you know, to make a long story short, most of these early companies, the people running them just really had no idea what they were doing and you know, <laughs> really making all the stuff, stuff up as they go along and probably made a lot of rookie mistakes that, you know, maybe people in other manufacturing industries or other types of production industries might have not made. Did you sort of see a lot of evidence of that kind of learning as they went and making things up as they went along? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely... All, if you look at the period from 1980 to just about the, the, the software shakeout, right? So that 1984, 85 moment um, where a bunch of these companies wind up disappearing, it's like wonderfully, deliciously apparent how much n many of them had no idea what was going on. Um, and they were, they were just, I mean, and, and that's captured well at Sierra, but it was, it was you know, if... Uh, you know, serious software was kind of, I get the sense, was had a very similar kind of um, situation going on. Those guys were kind of consummate pranksters within the industry. Um, I think one of the, I think, it's, I think it's hard for me maybe to, to anticipate what their mistakes were, because I think that what they are doing is actually a fairly common phenomena within the way that businesses kind of begin to arc out and then close in, right? Like it, it was... And, and, you know, folks like, um, Doug Carlson, I think, you know, he, he kind of, I think, kind of saw the sense that, that there would be a shakeout. I think a number of other people in the industry did as well, um, that that bubble burst and then it closed in and then it, and it expanded back out. Um, one of the things I've really loved to trace around this history, uh, in terms of those early relationships, um, are, is just how, like, close knit they were. And, and it was a way that I framed this before is that 
I think it was their economic precarity that really kind of drove their mutual aid. Um, they became friends kind of because they had to. Uh, because otherwise there was no way that they were going to be able to protect themselves from the people who they understood as their threats, which was like IBM and Atari. That actually leads uh, into my next question, which is that we've got a second column here that I think our listeners would really be interested in about uh, Broderbund and uh, especially about their financials. And uh, we'll, of course, link to both of these articles in the show notes. There's some great photos in here of sort of early financial, I say in scare quotes, statements uh, from, uh, I guess, from, from Broderbund. And uh, yes. one of them has uh, has their very first profit circled. And what's amazing about this document to me is how small all the numbers are. You know, we think of these companies <laughs> at the time, those of us who grew up playing these games, you know, we would go into the, the software store and we'd see these professional, you know, packages and imagine these great, amazing, huge companies that must be making these games that are also polished and professional. But here, you know, here's their their statement and, uh, you know, it's got, you know, $59 for postage and, uh, you know, $1.50 for bank fees. Uh, and with all of these, you know, numbers that are, you know, smaller than my gas bill and they've managed to squeak out a profit uh, that is, you know, less than my mortgage payment. So <laughs> I just find it really interesting to see these sort of early stages that you have no idea. So can you talk a little bit about what it was like to kind of dig through and find all these documents? Oh, my God. So um, just to give a little context so the the thing, the the images that you're referring to, um, were ones that I took at the Strong Museum of Play, which is up in Rochester, New York, which I, I think is probably most broadly known as, as kind of a children's museum. Um, but they also have this, I, I would consider them kind of probably one of the nation's leaders in uh, video and computer game preservation. They have an extensive research library. They have these really accommodating facilities for researchers. And uh, in the past year, Doug Carlston donated all of his his kind of internal documents to the strong it was i think there's a photo of it on that blog post you're referring to 14 boxes of stuff um mm -hmm. and i and i opened up every single one of those boxes and went through every <laughs> i didn't read them all but i was like by god i'm going to touch every one of these you know <laughs> Yeah, you, it makes you wonder, like, what, what did you think was going to happen? You know, I mean, I, <laughs> uh, I mean, they, they were able, I think at the moment where, where for so many of them it was one or two people, you know, kind of doing the programming and they could charge, you know, 50, 60 bucks for one of these games. I mean, there, there was a margin of profit to be made. It seems like there was a very stark shift that maybe happened one or two years in where I think this is maybe more the case at Sierra than it was for Broderbund. I always, I, I get the sense from looking at Doug's records that, that Doug had a, I think Doug kind of knew what he was doing, maybe a little bit more <laughs> than, than <laughs> most people. Um, you know, Ken Williams in interviews would, would always sort of have this kind of like, who knows what's going on kind of situation. And I look at, at Doug's memos and I'm like, no, Doug knew what the hell was up. Like, like Doug was taking care of himself. Um, and right, Broderbun is one of the ones that survives the shakeout, I think, I think kind of mm -hmm. precisely because there was a lot of care on the financial end, right? He was keeping a profit and loss sheet to begin with, right? Which mm -hmm. actually is, if you think about it, might not be someone's first instinct, right? He, he knew to itemize for postage, right? That, that shows mm -hmm. like a level of education, uh, a level of kind of like insight and preparation that actually many of these folks didn't have. Uh, when they when they started these these companies, yeah, I think uh, Ken is almost notorious for that. You know, he's often quoted as saying he didn't, you know, want there to be any knowledge of what was going on. He almost wanted to run it as this sort of chaotic, you know, creative ball of craziness, and somehow money would fall out the other side or something. He was almost proud of the fact that no one knew what was going on. I mean, it's very startup culture, right? I mean, I, I, I look at, or, you know, I look at something like the indie game scene today, which is having, I think, a similar set, or a, a not totally dissimilar set of growing pains around how do we actually make money? Um, and that has been kind of a, a major conversation that's taken off when you have these, you know, little teams of, uh, you know, a couple of people trying to actually produce a game on a really narrow budget and make a profit. Or actually, this has been coming up a lot, a lot around the X Sierra Kickstarters, right? Uh, this, um, you know, how much money is actually reasonable, do you actually need to be able to, to turn a profit on this? Um, 
It's actually a big topic uh, in my uh, day job as well. I work in mobile games and it's a similar sort of thing where everybody in the industry knows it's a big deal and we can all feel it and we can all feel that there's a lot of money here somewhere, but no one's quite sure how to get it. And so everybody's <laughs> trying different crazy business models and companies are starting up and dying overnight all over the place. Uh, so yeah, we all know there's something going on here, but none of us have quite managed to get our hands on the on the gold, on the brass ring just yet. You know, it happens for a few companies, right, that that make it big um, and are able to sustain for a while, and then there's just tons and tons and tons that never make it. I think that was one of the things I was also really surprised by when I started going through, let's say, old issues of of Soft Talk or um, you know Byte or, or any of these magazines was just how many people were involved who never made it. And that's part of the history um, that we don't talk about in video game history, right? Or, or you know, even in computing history, some sense, right? The people who were the biggest deals in the world for like four years, and then nobody knows who they are anymore, right? Like Bill Budge was on the cover of Softline, right? Who, like, who could you, who possibly knows who that man is today? If you're not already, if you're not already listening to Open Apple, right? <laughs> yes. Like, yeah, it's safe to say our audience knows who he is, but yes, <laughs> point well made. <laughs> Um, but he was like a king of his industry, you know, uh, in, in the same way that I think we have, we, there's, there's really interesting parallels to watch in terms of what's going on in, in, in the effort to produce an independent games industry, which I think in some ways is kind of struggling with the same market and um, user base issues. Yes, and very much the same uh, attitude of the, the people as well. I mean, indie gaming is really by far the most creative uh, and passionate corner of game development right now. You know, the, the AAA console market where most of the money is right now is it's very sort of Hollywood studio-esque. You know, there's a formula. Everybody knows we're going to crank out big sequels and we're going to charge a bunch of money and you need big marketing budgets and so on. It's all very much a machine now. And then there's the mobile side of it, which is very sort of fast and loose. Uh, it's more like... Uh, I don't know, uh, almost more like a, like a real estate market or something where there's a lot of money for a few people and it's, you know, people are coming and going. It's all very uh, fast paced and crazy. But then the indie area, that's where the people there, those are the people that really love games and they're in it for the love of the art. And, you know, they're, they're the ones making these games in their one bedrooms, you know, eating ramen <laughs> and just with this sort of belief that if they just make a good enough game, somehow money will happen. Uh, but it's not so much a business strategy as it is just this unquenchable desire to create. One of the pl interesting places where this parallel breaks down is how the indie of now uh, relates to what we might think of as the indie of then. Um, I gave a talk uh, maybe two years ago at IndieCade East about maybe kind of a uh, cautionary tale to the indie game industry about the fact that all of these guys in the early 80s called themselves independent. Right, That was the term that they used, uh, but what that never had on it was any kind of lacquer about artistic or personal creation in the same sense. Uh, there was certainly that kind of programming buzz and this love of making games, but there, there was not a kind of uh, political agenda or a sense of, of trying to like make independent art. Uh, that 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 was never kind of in operation uh, for the for the co the companies of the early 1980s. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's a little more more of a startup esque like early internet company vibe. Whereas yeah, modern indie gaming is much more of a um, more of like an indie film kind of vibe. Where it's yeah, sort of like they have something to prove that games are art. Yes, and they're trying yes. to advance the you know, the beauty and the state of that art and some sort of higher purpose uh, as opposed to, you know, just wanting to, to make cool things for money. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think the, you know, the sense that I've gotten from the companies of the early 80s, and, and here I, I'm really thinking specifically of, you know, Sierra slash online systems, Broderbund, Sirius, is that what drove them was this, this platform, right? Was this Apple II machine that they were fascinated by that they had no idea what and they that they also had no idea what to do with and i i look at the kind of outpouring of software that happens in that four-year period as indicative of um, everyone trying to figure out just what do i do with this thing right um it's it's like there was this kind of uh, 
excited delirium about figuring out um, what, what's this good for, right? And so we're going to make everything that we possibly can imagine for it, right? I mean, it's almost, it's, you go back and you read the advertisements for that period, it's like looking at app culture today, right? It's, <laughs> it's like they had, they, had, they had a floppy disk for everything, right? For stuff that you couldn't imagine ever wanting to, to do on your computer, you know, everything from, from calculating your gas mileage to, you know, organizing your recipes. It was, it was like, what, what did you think you were doing with this machine? And, and I think that that level of uh, experimentation and lack of direction is actually in, indicates to me something about what kind of future and vision and what kind of future people were trying to envision around this technology. Um, I think in, in, in academic settings, which is what I sort of, I, I guess, most professionally am, um, is, a, is an academic historian of this topic, uh, of, I'm an academic historian of the, you know, history of technology and, and kind of specifically within that, the history of computing and video games. Um, I think that when I look at the, what professional academics write about the history of computing, and, and this is where a lot of my kind of work tries to reposition that conversation, is that, um, y you get this, you can get this kind of trajectory that's like, I, I think the transition of the computer into domestic space is probably the single biggest transition in the history of computing that we have experienced. Um, or I wanted to kind of make the argument that it was. And I, I think that that has been most computer history focuses on technological transformations, right? It, it, it focuses on specific, you know, the invention of the microprocessor, et cetera, right? which is not, not related to this phenomena. But I, I really wanted to make a case for what is what is most culturally important about the computer rather than is what is most technologically important about the computer and if and if you wrote a history let's say that's not organized around the idea of of what the machine can technologically do but actually like where it is you get a very very different narrative about what is important in the history of computing. And so for me, this moment where it comes in the home and suddenly everyone's like, what do we do? Let's make everything under the sun for it, um, <laughs> is opens up something about the history of this machine that I think we've never really talked about, um, especially from kind of an academic perspective. Yeah, I love that. Uh, I love that angle on all this. Yeah, as you say, the the history tends to focus very much on on the how it all happened. You know, yes, we had yes. CPUs and memory, and not very much about the the what or the why it all happened. Why did people actually embrace these things? And it's easy to forget, uh, especially I suppose those of us who grew up with this remember. But uh, people today might, you know, younger folks might not realize when these things came out. Uh, nobody knew what to do with them. Nobody knew. We all yes. knew these. With these, we all knew these computers were a really big deal. We could all feel it, but we weren't sure exactly why or what they were going to be for. We just knew they were really definitely going to be for something. <laughs> uh, so you know, it's easy to look back today because it's so obvious. Well, obviously, you're going to do your taxes on them and you're going to write your term papers and whatever. Uh, but uh, at the time, especially you know, pre-internet and, and pre any sort of networking. Uh, it was very much less clear what these things were, were going to be for. Yeah, I think that's absolutely the case. And that was one of the refrains I, I, I kind of picked up on that made me realize that something was going on here. Everyone was like, what do we do with it? Um, and that was kind of a, a perspective I brought to, or I've brought to my reading of something like Mystery House, right? Which is Sierra's um, first graphical adventure game. And I think what was important about that game was that it was something that only an Apple II could do, right? It, like, it didn't matter that those, I mean, those puzzles are, are I, 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 the one thing I do struggle to do is put myself in the position of someone who actually played these games in the 1980s, because I got through like 20 minutes of Mystery House and I was like, nope, like I can't, <laughs> I just can't, I can't do this, you know? And so I was like, all right, I'm just going to watch a Let's Play and I'm going to follow along in this game. Um, but I, but uh, people propelled themselves through these uh, weird narratives, through these these uh, really, you know, this is embryonic puzzle design, right? Um, not because these games were great, but I think because they wanted to do something with these machines. And in particular, that, that capacity of high-res graphics was such a big deal. It was such a selling point. One of the things I've also sort of discovered is that 
the history of computing has yet to reckon with the extent to which games have actually been the way in which most people have come into contact with a computer to begin with. Um, that, that most of our first exposure to a computer was, was through gaming. And that what games really do, what's, what the game software does with computer hardware is it, is it kind of pushes it to its edge, right? And there's no other software that really kind of, that's its function. Right? That's what it's meant to do. It gets into this interestingly reciprocal relationship where it's always trying to like move forward on the boundary of what the machine is capable of doing. And I think that, that gaming is owed a lot of historical credit um, in terms of people figuring out like what are the limits and boundaries of a machine like this. Definitely. And you know, something we've talked a lot about on the show is that when these technologies are new, it's just the early adopters that are using them and they're using this to do things for the sake of the technology. So they'll do things like yes. put their address book in an Apple II, when in fact, that's <laughs> worse at the time than a paper <laughs> you know, agenda uh, date book is. And it's only these things only go mainstream when something comes along that's genuinely better than the other way of doing it. Something like VisiCalc, where, okay, this actually, you know, replaces uh, an accountant and six bookkeepers. So that's a genuinely better way to do something we're already doing. Uh, But gaming is that area where it was instantly and immediately a better way to do that, you know, because, of course, the worst part of playing board games, card games, et cetera, is keeping track of all the rules and the scores and so on. And computers were just an instant perfect fit for that. And uh, I think that's, yeah, that's still true. Yeah. And you could build experiences that were actually, you know, unlike anything you could do in any kind of analog format. Yeah. We, we talked about, I think, what was it? The last show that talked about what it was like to have your, have your cookbook, your recipes on your Apple II. And realistically, are you going to lug this thing into the kitchen and try and have it up on the screen while you've got flour and oil and everything? And, or, or are you going to, you're going to sit there and wait while it prints out on your, your, you know, your Epson FX80, the, the, the dot matrix back and forth. Um, and it really didn't become a, a, a good thing until, I guess, you know, until you started having things like the iPad where you could just set it up and, yeah. and, and go and, but without having those early seeds of, Hey, let's put all of my recipes on an Apple II because I can, you never get to having the iPad there to help you cook. Yeah. And the, I think, the, I think the, the phenomenon of recipe software is one that I really love, um, precisely because it is so curiously gendered and it's, oh, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's this one thing that we, right? What do all of our popular narratives about, about, uh, this period in computing look like, right? They're all guy focused. Um, there, and, and all of our, you know, whether it's, whether it's hackers or when wizards stay up late or, or it can, you know, all of our kind of journalistic fic, uh, nonfiction about this tends, uh, you know, to, to a 90th percentile kind of focus on the big men of computer history. I, I think similar to, to what I was saying before, if you take this kind of domestic perspective of what was this machine doing in domestic space? How did it change domestic life? Um, and the fact that like so many guys were trying to sell their wives on the idea <laughs> that, that this would make their lives easier. I mean, it's this kind of fascinating cultural phenomenon where suddenly this object is actually becoming gendered in a really interesting way. It's not, you can't claim that this is some machine that has, is obviously masculine, right? Which I think a lot of our, our histories about computing have have implicitly or explicitly kind of claimed, right? That sure. computing is this guy's thing. And when I, I, I know I bring up soft talk a lot, and I think that, that it's because that magazine had a very particular tenor. And I think it was because, it, like, the fact that it had a female editor in chief, Margot Comstock, is not to be underrated, and it was one of the most largely distributed magazines in the Apple II community. You get an image of that magazine of people trying to figure out, okay, how do I live with this thing? What do I do with it? Right? And, and some of these letters to the editor I would read, it's clear that people are printing out their recipes, right? Like they're, <laughs> they're, they're, they're sending in these like angered letters to the editor of like, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a lot, you know, there's a, there's a programming failure at this line. Can somebody help me out? Or this isn't working, or I've, I've produced a better fix for this. And, you know, one of the things I've been kind of documenting is where are people talking about their families, about their wives, uh, making references to their children? How can we get away from talking about this machine as this thing that was purely this kind of male enclave object, because I think that increasingly 
what I'm trying to kind of, I'm both, I think is both validly there in the archive and that I want to rescript with a lot of my work is, is that this was, in many ways, people related to these things as a family machine. And we don't have a history about that. Um, we don't talk about computing, early computing in that way, right? What's our point of reference? War games. And I, and I think there's a way of thinking about these, these machines where, I mean, one of the things I love is where people have these conversations about, well, wh ask somebody where they put their, their computer, right? I mean, computers have a, are related to the history of the architecture of the home, right? They change the library into the office. Um, all fantasies about telecommuting are predominantly interested in like the work role of women because, because of these questions about who's going to be around for the family. Um, you have, you have the emergence of ergonomics, right? Uh, you know, you, you have the, the, I, I love, I am, I am fascinated to, to an almost disturbing degree with the invention of computing furniture. <laughs> um, and, and the extent to which, like, these ads are like, you know, like they, they want to talk about the wood finish, right? Or, or how good it'll look in your home. I want to tell the story of the computer kind of through that lens. Um, that it's, it's this thing where you're trying to figure out, like, how do, how do I make this part of my, part of my household? Right? Not this thing that is alien, but this thing that is actually, like, really, like, my question is, how did the computer become personal? I think it's about its role in domestic space. Yeah, I love that you brought that up, actually, because, yeah, you've sort of rekindled a, a memory of, uh, you know, my family, we, our first computer was, uh, was an Apple II Plus, and we went through, I distinctly remember that exact experience of literally, <laughs> where does this thing go in our house? And that was very sort of subconsciously tied to what are we going to do with this thing? And so, of course, I'm sure like many people, you know, when we brought it home the first day, it went on the kitchen table. And that lasted about a day and a half, you know, all those things in the way. Uh, so it's like, well, it's kind of like we can hook it up to the TV sometimes for the big color screen. So uh, let's put it next to the TV. And, you know, your TV is in the front of the room and the sofas are all facing it. And it's like, well, this is sort of silly. Now I'm sitting at the front of the room next to the TV and everyone else is behind me. So that doesn't really make sense. So then we put it at the back of the room. But, well, now I'm facing away from everyone and there's the TV is distracting. So then we put it in the den for a while and then we had it in the you know, in my bedroom for a while, it was in the basement for a while. So we literally <laughs> tried every room in the house trying to figure out where this thing belongs. Like there's no house, there's no room in your house for the computer. You know where your books go, you know where your bed goes, you know, but where does the computer go? Yeah, Mike, where did, where did you put your, uh, your, your Apple II? Well, my first computer was actually an Apple III that my father brought home from work every weekend set up in what became, like you said, it went from a library to a den slash office. And he would set his Apple III up in there and then pack it up and, and take it back. And when we got our uh, our own Apple II Plus, it started in there. And, and my mother kept complaining about it because I would stay up late and print stuff out and the printer would wake them up. And <laughs> and uh, so it ended up, eventually it ended up back in my bedroom on my desk. But uh, but yeah, I, it, it is, it, it's interesting. I, it's not a topic I'd ever thought of before to... to how did this thing, how did our house revolve around this computer and where it sat and how did that affect how it interacted with our lives? Some of it was just maybe default. Um, our, our Apple II Plus ultimately ended up in my bedroom as well. And it was literally down to after a couple of years of this thing migrating around the house, uh, my sister never showed any interest in it. And my mom and dad eventually just, I think, gave up trying to figure out what it was and what it was for. And so there was just this sort of, well, Quinn knows apparently what to do with this thing. So let's just put it in her room. And that was the end of it. So It's one of my favorite questions to ask people um, when they talk about computing from this time period, because suddenly that you get this story of how people's houses worked. Um, and you realize that this was an object that was it was in relationship to people's lives. A lot of my thinking in this has been influenced uh, in terms of cultural history. There's there's a great book called Make Room for TV by a by a cultural historian at Northwestern University named Lynn Spiegel. Uh, and the general premise of her, her her book was that, you know, when when the television comes into domestic space, it fundamentally alters the caliber of domestic life. And she's not just talking about content. She says, what is the what is the technology itself do to the way we live? Suddenly architecture changes, suddenly you get the invention of the open floor plan. Everything from you know what kind? What kind of veneer are we going to put out on, on the outside of it? To these fears about 
oh, is my is my son gonna get an an underbite because he leans his head forward on his jaw to watch <laughs> television? Right. This was a real. There was tremendous hysteria about this. And the place where she was able to locate a lot of these conversations were actually in women's magazines. So there were there were these dialogues happening among women about this new technology in the home. And this was kind of the revelation of her book, right? It was it was one of the first real like feminist cultural histories of 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 a of a, of a technology in this sense. And when I, I read that book and I thought, there has to be an analog to this for the computer. And it's and it's weird and kind of dumb and kind of obvious that we haven't figured that out yet. When when I started this dissertation, it's funny, I I had no proof for the dissertation proposal that I wrote. Um, I just had this hunch. I was like, there has to be a domestic history of the personal computer, right? Um, but I had not done any archive work. <laughs> and and I think I think if I had been at a different school or had a different advisor, there is no way that they ever would have let me do this project. Because they would have said, like, where are you going to go? Like, and I was just like, no, I just have a feeling, right? I have a vibe. Like, I know that there's something correct here. Um, a lot of this has been influenced by my own personal history, which is that I, I, I learned the computer from my mom. You know, I had these kinds of memories of she was the person in the household who knew how to use it. You know, she was the one who taught me how to install software. She was the one who played games with me. Uh, the computer was in my bedroom. But she was the one who taught me how to operate it. She was, you know, when we needed to add extra memory, right? It was me and her unscrewing the back of the machine to, like, install these chips. Hmm. And I went and I read all of this computer history and all this video game history. And I was just kind of like, where's my mom in this? Right? Like, you bring an object, you bring a technology into domestic space. Who spends the most time with it? The housewife. Right? It's, it's just, it's just, it's just math. And so there can't be no relationship here, right? If, and especially if you think about the way that computing was introduced predominantly into the educational sector first, um, and, and who, who dominates that occupation, right? It would be women. Um, or you, you think about, right, who typing was considered secretarial, right? It was, very, it was not uncommon that, that the computer might be handed off to your secretary before it would be handed off to a manager, uh, because of the uh, sort of attitude around the kind of labor that was attached to the computer in the office in, in the early to mid-1980s. That goes all the way back, in fact, because, you know, the first computer programmers were women, and, it be and that's because it grew out of data entry, which, again, was considered sort of yes. menial women's work. And so they sort of, uh, unbeknownst to everyone, grew into what would become the most critical uh, profession uh, of the 20th and 21st centuries. And, and it's such a shame that we you know, have have lost the capacity to, I think, tell more honest and rich stories about the histories of these technologies uh, because of the kind of car cultural garbage that we carry around them, uh, that we can't kind of sort of see them for, for what they were. So in all of your uh, research on the dissertation and whatnot, uh, you, said, uh, you said that you hadn't, uh, you sort of post-dated uh, the Apple II yourself. Uh, did you, have you in uh, come across Apple IIs in your research and actually gotten to uh, get your hands on them? So I actually have an Apple II that sits in my living room uh, on top of a small filing cabinet. I uh, kind of randomly put a Craigslist ad out in New York City and got a response from someone who is part of the New York, um, who, was a, who was a New York State high school teacher. Uh, and he's like, oh yeah, I've got this thing sitting in my basement. Do you want to take it off my hands? <laughs> Uh, right, so I, I found a friend with a car. We drove to this guy's house, and it was it was hilarious over email because he's like, "Can you please give me a landline so I can call you?" And I was like, "Sir, I haven't had a landline in, <laughs> you know, like eight years, right?" I mean, you're, 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 it, like the generational gap was profound. Um, <laughs> wow. And he unloaded. So I had, I have an, I have a Apple II CPU. I had th monitors from three different types of apples, two hard drives two dot matrix printers, which I have not yet figured out if they work, and then just like boxes and boxes and boxes of floppy disks. I found that this, I was absolutely fascinated that this guy had grades input to grade software on a five and a quarter disk from the early 2000s. Oh my and, I, and I was just like, this is the culture of computing I want to talk about, right? <laughs> like, like, like screw the cutting edge, right? This guy is fascinating. Like he knew his one piece of software and he used it for 25 years. 
right? And like, why would he need anything better? He's just inputting a number, like. <laughs> <laughs> And so I, I, I was, I had to do a, a bit of finagle. Like two of the monitors were blown out. I finally got the third one to work. I had to find like a, you know, RCA cable to connect the monitor to the, to the CPU. I did do a fair bit of Googling, but I've been able to turn the machine on to run some of the software that I have. Yeah, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I, I, yeah, I don't remember. I mean, I have no real experience with the, the, the 8-bit era, but I, I remember the kind of um, the, the late 80s computing, right, uh, f- fairly well. We, uh, we were still on floppy disks, but even just the phenomenon of, right, you're pre-mouse, so some of these games have what you would think of as a cursor today, but you're, you're just moving this kind of, uh, you know, icon using your arrow keys on, on, on the keypad itself, right? It's, it's, uh, it's very strange. But I've not been... I've not been able to, let's say, or have not yet tried to run, uh, let's say, some of the historical games that I've I've written about um, on the authentic hardware. I think that in, I think in a lot of ways I've been, in the same way that I've displaced talking about the designers, I've been. It has not been my priority necessarily to engage with the technical capacity of the machine, which is not to say that I don't un- understand it or, or the you know. Um, but it's really been important for me to hone in on that, that kind of cultural lived history with it just as an object, right? Just think of it as a kind of an appliance. You might uh, actually, to get another perspective on it, you might actually be interested in getting one of those dot matrix printers up and running. Uh, you know, Mike alluded <laughs> to this uh, earlier. Uh, but I mean, those were a really significant factor in how and where people used computers in their houses, because, you know, again, people today have no idea how loud and how slow those things were. So if you wanted to print a, you know, a school paper or something, you had to have this incredibly loud thing running for a very long time. So where do you put this in your house that isn't going to completely disrupt everything else happening in the house? So that, you know, that was a real difficult uh, consideration for a lot of houses. The FCC was was concerned about RFI uh, emissions, and they should have been concerned about the level of those, <laughs> those those printers. The other thing about them was that because they were the dot matrix and they had the tractor feed paper, you generally would go to Office Max or or whatever and get this big box, and and you had to set up the printer in such a way that the paper could conveniently feed up, yes. print out, and then mm-hmm. curl up somewhere where you could could then collect it in an organized manner and it's not all tangled up. So yeah, getting, getting back to your, your um, comments uh, about layout and, and setup or those things were, were of vital importance, I think. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, the, the, the furniture of computing was challenging enough. I mean, you know, we went through that in our family as well, trying to figure out what kind of furniture to put this thing on. You know, we went through various kinds of, of hutches and tables and combinations of stools <laughs> and chairs trying to figure out, well, how do you sit in front of this thing and what's the right height for it to be at? Uh, but then, yeah, dot matrix printers were this whole other level of furniture <laughs> difficulty because, yeah, okay, this thing has to be, you know, exactly three to four feet off the ground and it has to have room under it for this box of paper, which then has to curl up at just the right angle or the printer will jam or the tractor feeds will tear. And then there has to be somewhere for the output to go that's also at just the right angle and just, you know, yeah, the <laughs> dot matrix printers were a, <laughs> uh, a furniture challenge for the ages. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right on the, uh, the invention... The, the the printer stand right becomes its own piece of kind of hardware if you want to <laughs> think of it in that sense I, I think the the importance of the printer was not something that really dawned on me unfortunately until I was going through a uh, Doug Carlston's internal documentation from Broderbund up at the Strong Museum so because Broderbund published print shop and when I was kind of looking through the materials and the photography and the the sort of internal conversation about that software at the company, it suddenly dawned on me like, oh, this was this entirely other way that people built relationships to their computer was that actually they made something for their non-computer life on a Mm -hmm. computer. They tore it off, you know, the, the printer, and then they took it somewhere else, whether it was your, your school paper or your birthday banner. And, Broderbund had a couple different types of this software. They had um, Toy Shop, where the whole principle, even the packaging on the box, right, was that you would print out um, a paper model of something and then 
you would cut it out, you would take it somewhere else, right? And you would cut it out and you would put together a little model. And the, and the image on the package, right, is this daughter and grandfather, is this like granddaughter and grandfather doing this together. And that was the moment where it occurred to me that the, the printer was, the printer was something that enabled the computer to be about a new way of life. The software like that indicates something about the idea that computer is not just about the screen, right? It's also about this, this idea that I can go and make something with it, um, that I can have this family relationship that's, that's tied to it. And, and then to, to follow up on your, your, your sort of statement about noise, I, I actually love that you're saying this because I hadn't thought about the noise of printers. Um, I've thought a lot about the noise of the teletype machine in the Williams's home when they, but prior to when, when Roberta Williams first played Colossal Cave Adventure. Um, oh, right. Because yeah. when I was, I was working on my dissertation, I was like, I had passed some emails back and forth with Ken, and I was like, okay, what is, you know, I didn't really know what a teletype machine was, right? And I was trying to get him to kind of nail down the model, and he, he you know, he, he, he kicked back, I think it was, a, you know, an ARS, like, 32. And so I, I, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, I was like, how do I learn about this machine? Right. I don't have access to one. I, there's nowhere in New York where I can, or, you know, there's no like institution in New York where I can go see one. Uh, so I went to YouTube. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I just like, I, I mean, right. This is, this is the amazing thing that fans and enthusiasts and, you know, citizen historians do. Right. I, I just typed the model into YouTube and it kicked up um, a video of, someone using one of these and I was like holy crap this is loud like I, I it just and and there was it was great because they took the camera all the way around the machine and I realized like this is mostly a mechanical device I mean there's digital components but there's like gears and there's springs and there's bands and I had it's like this is this is electromechanical this isn't a computer in the sense that I was thinking about it um, and I really got in touch with how much that machine must have kind of dominated life. I knew that they lived in like a one-story home. And I was like, wow, when, when Ken was sitting there programming, it just must have been, I, I, where would you hide, right? <laughs> and, and there's these kind of early quotes you can find of Roberta talking about, you know, just how like weird and gross she kind of thought Ken's relationship with the computer was that, that you know, like she was like, I don't, you know, I, I think a lot of wives are turned off by it. These men go and they want to just obsess over this machine. You know, once you, and you know, she said, you know, once I sat down and got into it, I was hooked. But I, I thought a lot about just what the impact of that machine must have been on her life, uh, her sense of relationship with her partner, uh, you know, how much it must kind of like dominated domestic space in an acoustic way became the noise of the machine actually became part of the story in this way that like I could have never I was only able to reconstruct through kind of hypothesizing a whole bunch of different material components that I was certain of and then figuring out okay yeah this must have been kind of the map of what was going on you should uh, you should interview my mom she could go on at length about the impact the uh, Epson <laughs> FX80 had on the noise in our household oh, <laughs> but yeah it's uh, <laughs> You're definitely right, though. I mean, if 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 a dot matrix printer is a uh, is a jackhammer, an ASR thirty three teletype is a machine gun. <laughs> uh, you know, they were just yeah, a whole other level of loud. Uh, they are really just absolutely wonderful machines. You know, they're they're definitely they are the bridge from electromechanical to uh, to modern uh, digital. They're they're clockwork marvels. Uh, difficult to maintain and keep operational, and very expensive and very heavy. Uh, but uh, yeah, for the true, true enthusiast of uh, you know '60s big iron, uh, <laughs> nothing quite like it. <laughs> I remember uh, I was talking with Jim Walls, and for some reason he he mentioned that at at his police station they had they, the stuff would the the broadcast reports would from the main station would come in on a teletype, and he was like the thing had its own room because you had to shut a door because it was so loud, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, I was like, you were still using this in the early 80s, you know? I mean, just these, the way that the stuff um, hangs out, you know, long past the time period that you, that everyone thinks that it should. So uh, getting back to, to your origins here for just a minute, um, why, why Sierra um, as opposed to some of these other companies? You know, there was Broderbund and Epics and, and a few others. You could have chosen any of them. Why? What, what was it about Sierra that drew you in? So originally when I was, 
working on my my dissertation, which I'm you know I've, I've I've graduated now and I'm I'm working on kind of flipping that into a book. What I originally wanted the dissertation to be about was this domestic history of the personal computer that wound up actually being way too big of an idea, and I I scaled it down. But what I had kind of already set up in the middle of that idea was this one chapter on this thing that I remembered from my childhood, which was this weird, this weird mythology about this woman who made her games at her kitchen table, right? If I'm interested in, do, in a domestic history of the personal computer, this is one of those moments where kind of the computer and domesticity become intertwined, right? They can't be unlinked. Um, and so, so what is it about, uh, and, and that was the story of Roberta Williams, right? Hmm. Um, was that that was her whole marketing shtick beginning in kind of the late 80s was uh, this kind of the the Martha Stewart of domestic computing right there was something about I mean there's all sorts of you know all this very specific kind of publicity images get taken of her Uh, there's this rhetoric that surrounds her where she calls her games the the miracles from her kitchen right there's there's this way in which software game software became front-loaded as family oriented and it became about separating the idea of the computer from this thing that, like, you know, is about obsessionalism or uh, being a weirdo or being separated from your family. And in the context that Sierra framed it, it was actually all about this thing that was supposed to bring family together. And I was like, well, that's a that's a fascinating um, rhetoric. That's a that's a story we don't have about the computer. And so I knew that there, I, I had this idea of one chapter. I was really looking at it from the point of view of gender. And uh, this kind of these representations of domestic space. And when I made the decision that the original idea was too big, because by the time I had shown up in Oakhurst two years ago, I, I just began to realize like how much was there under Sierra's hood. Uh, I felt like every time I, I discovered a new person or or dug up some weird piece of information, it was it was twisting some kind of pat narrative we had about the invention of games. Uh, I think a lot of that had to do with acquainting myself with the early Apple II period and realizing that, you know, if, if you study games in academia, the, the stuff that's talked about almost exclusively from that time period is interactive fiction. Some of you may be familiar with Nick Montfort's book, Twisty Little Passages, which is kind of, a, you know, it's, it's sort of the academic monograph on the subject. Um, and I was like, wait, this book seems to have seems to not actually represent in any way like what people were actually playing. Like, like, I was like, interactive fiction was like, you know, Infocom was a big deal, but it was still pretty niche. I, I just realized there was like so much that this company history was disproving about these, uh, these narratives that were circulating within academic, and I, w- I would also say kind of within journalistic history, that I realized I had a really good case on my hands. I mean, and you also have what other company is co-founded by a woman? Right hmm. or or who had an eighteen year career in game design? Like what the hell? Like like <laughs> we don't we don't even have a way of like appropriately explaining this, right? We know <laughs> that we can call her a woman, but we don't ha- know what else to say about her. And that that silence, the way in which actually the things that we say about Roberta Williams are like super repetitive, and really obvious, became for me an object of fascination. I was like, why can't we say more interesting things about her? Like what's stopping us? What haven't we noticed? I, I think that you you could do it about Broderbund. I think that there's a I think that the first person to crack into uh, the Broderbund archive at the Strong is going to have a phenomenal, just majestic economic history of the early computer game, uh, the early com- home computer software industry. One of the other things I realized was that, especially in this early period from the eighty to eighty four, it wasn't just about games. That was the other thing that made me realize this was about how do I bring a computer into domestic space. All of these companies were making not just game software. And so it kind of it kind of bucked this model we had of talking about video game companies as just companies that make games. And it was like, well, you know, all of these companies were they were also putting out, you know, in- interpreters and compilers and it just didn't match with anything else that I was uh, encountering in terms of a representation of the time period. And it's ideal that Sierra had a long enough history. I mean, it and Broderbund are really kind of, they are similar cases in terms of lifespan, in terms of kind of singular ownership. Um, 
But also that, that, that weird regionalist history that Sierra had is also something that makes it kind of an optimal case. You can't do that. You, in a sense, you can't do that with Broderbund. You can't do that with epics. You can't do that with Penguin or something, right? Um, uh, when you go to Oakhurst, California, you know, what you see is this town that is still really interested in its kind of mythology as part of the gold rush. Right, um, and it is it is wonderfully in contrast to the, to the idea that that it was also trying to f be the future of computer gaming. If you go if you go to the, the the town historical park, there's a monument that was established at the at Oakhurst Centennial, which was a couple years ago, that claimed that Oakhurst, California, was the birthplace of computer gaming. <laughs> and and I lo I looked at this thing and I was like, what? Like, <laughs> I was, and I was like. I've, I've never heard this claim before. This is amazing, right? You know, the town considered on the monument, it, it had its three claims to fame. And the, the first one was its role in the gold rush. And, and, you know, the other major one was Sierra Online. And I was like, in terms of someone who wants to tell a story, right, what better kind of thematic juxtaposition do you get? than this kind of weird mountain town where people were trying to invent the future of technology. Uh, it just, it like all just like worked together way too well. Are you now involved at all with this Art of Sierra preservation thing? I know Brett Herbert and uh, Brandon Klassen uh, and Eric Chang through the Sierra online fan community, uh, which now uh, predominantly thrives through Facebook. Uh, I'm not a participant in the in the development of that book itself. It's something that has kind of, you know, I've been keeping an eye on and that has sort of been running alongside what I've been doing. Um, I'll say that I've, I've met Eric Chang. Um, I met him when I, I did a, a oral history trip up to Seattle. Um, you know, Brad and Brandon have been very useful for me sometimes when I've just needed an image of something that like in no other way could I get a hold of myself. Uh, you know, there's times when I've emailed Brad Herbert and just been like, do you have like the original Ziploc bag of Mystery House? And like, sure enough, you, you can like send me, send me a scan of it. And it's like, I, there's no museum that I know that even has this, you know, and, I, and I've worked hard to, to, you know, develop and maintain positive relationships with those guys because I, I understand that they have been putting their uh, you know, long periods of their lives into what should hopefully be for Sierra fans, like a really lush project. Um, I think that they are interested a lot in the games, and I think that that is maybe where, and, and also in kind of the big stories around the game designers, and I think that's where our interests don't always meet up, right? I, I want to tell kind of a different set of stories. Um, I think the games are something I want to, I, I will address in a kind of a lateral way. Uh, I think in a lot of ways, when this book comes out, you know, if, if I have one fear, it's that you know, video game enthusiasts are going to read it and say like, well, you didn't talk enough about the games, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, well, Jesus Christ, you know, I mean, I, I, there's all this other, other stuff that remains to be said, right? And that's the thing that I want to, I want to go after. So they've done, uh, yeah, Brandon has done some really phenomenal um, preservation archive work. I mean, he was there years before I even ever thought I would be working on a project like this, you know, getting in contact with a lot of these a lot of the game designers and a lot of people who worked in like marketing and art production and programming. And, you know, it's been with their help that I was able to track down a lot of the folks at Sierra uh, kind of to begin with. Yeah, they've been really uh, generous collaborators in the moments where I've needed them. I think the best stories are always about the people anyway, you know, because otherwise it's just a box sitting there on the table. Definitely. <laughs> Yeah, and I think I don't think anyone can claim that uh, the games of that era have not gotten their due. So uh, right. I, I, for one, <laughs> am uh, very glad to hear other perspectives on the era and the companies. No interview uh, with you would be complete without at least touching on this. Uh, you spent a day with Al Lowe, is that right? I spent two days actually with okay. Al Lowe. So please tell me he was wearing a leisure suit. <laughs> he, he was he was wearing a polo shirt. Oh. You know, he, he looked very domesticated. <laughs> Um, he was so sweet. So it was, so I visited Oakhurst twice. The second time I went, the first time was just kind of like a, a, you know, an expedition of like, what's here. And the second time I went, I, um, kind of made a big production out of it. I, I sent out press releases to local papers asking to do interviews with XCR employees. And that was how I got my kind of first bank of interviews. 
Um, and then I really, you know, as I was working my way through the company history, I, I, I was like, okay, I need to go to Seattle and see what's up. Because there's a bunch of XCR employees there. And this is part of the history that I really have less of a grasp on. And I was doing the same thing that I was normally doing, right? Where it was like, all right, I'm going to focus on the people who, whose stories that we don't hear. And it only kind of occurred to me at some point. I was like, oh, yeah, Al Lowe is there. I was like, I should probably talk to him, you know, while I'm in the area. And so, you know, Al and I had, uh, an, we have, I have eight and a half hours of audio with Al. <laughs> Oh uh, he was extremely generous at the time. It took two, yeah. So um, I think it took us probably over an hour just to get to the point where he got to Sierra. Because <laughs> like the because the pre Sierra history is actually super interesting. You know he, you know Al, Al Al puts together his own little kind of like software shop with one of his neighbors, and he, I, I think I can accurately say that Al was the first individual to score a high school band competition using a, I believe, a, a mainframe hooked up remotely. <laughs> um, like, like he, was, he was kind of pulling these stunts in the late 70s where um, rather than, than having all of these like parent judges do the math on these band competitions he had to organize, he, he, he figured out, he, he developed a program and, and then was using, um, I, I, I believe, an acoustic coupler to transmit the data oh, <laughs> back to the... Yeah, I mean, and I was like, so for me, often my interest is, is not only like, what did you do at Sierra, but like, how did you get there, right? What was, what was your experience with computing prior to that? Because those stories are always like unexpected and very weird. Uh, beginning with Sierra, it always, I, I don't know, I think it kind of misses the point of um, what a lot of my work is about, which is like, like, what have been people doing with this technology? So I think the first day I spent maybe three hours with him and then I had to come back and it was like, a fun, you know, I mean, we ordered pizza. I think there was a bottle of wine involved. Um, <laughs> Al was extremely gracious. Um, you know, he really let me sit there and like grill him about how like the AGI engine worked. I was like, no, explain it to me technologically. You know, he, he had to get out a piece of paper and he was drawing the priority system for me. And it was the first time that engine ever made sense. Because I, I mean, some of the I, I, you know, I've talked about Heitman and to Chris Iden, and, and there was something about talking with Al when he drew it for me, and I was suddenly like, oh, okay, now I understand how how these how these games were designed. Um, yeah, because his his history is is really long at that company. Yeah, I, I couldn't say enough nice things about Al. He was <laughs> he was a he was a total sweetheart. That's excellent. Well. Uh, I wish we could talk to you all night, but uh, we should uh, probably not keep you uh, much longer. Uh, Mike, do you have any last questions for uh, for Lane? Um, I don't think so, other than to say that uh, I'm a huge fan of your work. I'm going to fanboy out here for just a minute and uh, <laughs> say that if you are not following Lane on Twitter and, and reading her projects, you are really missing out. And speaking of all that, Lane, where can we find your stuff? Where can you find my stuff? So... Uh, you can find my uh, my website is www.lanemooney.com. I post pretty regularly on the blog and uh, on the on the splash on the front page of the site. I also keep an update of my recent interviews and uh, or or writings that I've done. Uh, I'll certainly be posting my interview with you folks up on there as soon as this is live. Um, and so yeah, keeping tabs on my website and my Twitter account. Uh, my Twitter name is. Sierra, S-I-E-R-R-A, underscore, offline, O-F-F-L-I-N-E. That's the best way to stay on top of what I'm up to. One thing I would like to say is that currently, uh, and for the past year, I have been a postdoctoral researcher at NYU, uh, New York University, in the Department of Media, Culture, and Communication. I can't speak enough to um, how impossible it is to do this work unless this work is your job. And I feel really grateful that this work gets to be my job. Uh, it's something I get to work on every day. And starting in uh, August, uh, I've taken a position as an assistant professor of digital media at Georgia Tech. So I think that's going to be really exciting. I'm going to be teaching game design, of all things, which I'm a little nervous about. But I think, I think, uh, I think it'll happen. And yeah, I'll be able to continue my work from a very well cared for position down, down in Georgia, down in Atlanta. That's awesome. Well, thank you uh, very much for your time and congratulations on the new position down there. And uh, yeah, it's been great having you on the show. Thank you. This has been such a delightful conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lane. Thank you. 
It may be old, but there's still news. Apple 2 News. So I guess it's time for, for news. We got a lot of it. Uh, hopefully uh, we can knock it out, though. I'm sure that some of this will be fairly old. But once again, thank you uh, to, to Lane for, for showing up and uh, just a whole bunch of wow and holy crap, she's great for me. Yeah, likewise. She is awesome. Super glad we could have her on the show. We'll have links to all of her, her social media and projects and stuff in the show notes. So, All right, Quinn, what do we got? Well, uh, first thing uh, on the list here, I think, is about Rastan. Uh, a couple of episodes ago, we did uh, sort of a special, uh, a very special episode of Open Apple. <laughs> and uh, that was an 80s uh, TV reference for uh, the uh, people Soft of a certain piano age. music playing in the background. That's right, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we did... Uh, we did Mom, a, uh, can I talk to you for a minute? <laughs> That's right. Not that kind of special episode. However, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it was very special for Apple II folks uh, in the sense that uh, Matt Ownsby interviewed John Brooks about the uh, copy protection and other awesome technical details in Rastan, uh, the best 2GS game probably ever made. Uh, so there's a little bit of follow-up on that. A uh, thread was started on hackzapple.com about this and uh, it's pretty interesting the uh, one of the listeners of the show uh, actually listened to that interview and proceeded to kind of live blog their efforts to crack the game and they kind of it's it's cool that you can see that the person kind of was cracking it uh, as they listened to the episode and uh, so they're trying trying things and you know that are mentioned in the episode and that doesn't work so they try something else and they're kind of live blogging the whole thing in this forum thread I believe that's actually Antoine of um, uh, Brutal Deluxe. That's because uh, I know he runs the Hex Apple or Hexy Apple site, and I believe he's the one that was uh, listening listening along and and uh, cracking as the show uh, show progressed. So then, at the end of this thread, uh, Antoine arrives at the same conclusion that uh, uh, that they got to in the interview, which is basically that the crack for it was uh, essentially to crack uh, the Protoss uh, API, since the, uh, the that was easier to do than than actually cracking Rastan. You can kind of do this manipulation of of the API call to Protoss and uh, make Rastan think uh, that it's not cracked when it is. How did you put that on Facebook exactly? Um, something about a distraction. Oh yes, yes. Uh, one does not crack Rastan. One merely distracts Rastan while it's checking if it has been cracked. Uh, in in the forum thread, what's cool is that John Brooks then jumps in, uh, and uh, he says, uh, "Nicely done. Uh, if you have time and want an extra challenge, uh, he throws down the gauntlet again, and uh, he says, uh, number one, remove the code checksum so that the OS does not need to be patched, and otherwise, uh, in other words, determine how the CRC checksum is being done." and uh, disable that rather than actually uh, hacking up uh, Protoss. And uh, then the, the really fascinating part, number two, he says, uh, find the back door. Uh, he says, I intentionally put in a back door so the protection could be disabled and development cheat codes added without modifying the game executables or loading any additional files or modifying the OS before Rastan itself was run. While developing and testing Rastan, I didn't want to wait for the protection check code every time I assembled and tested the game, so I had built-in support for removing compression and also adding things like invincibility, jumping to a level, and so forth. Uh, I don't think anyone has found the back door yet, though, probably because they never expected one. So uh, he says it's great to see you digging into these long, hidden uh, programming tricks and secrets. Uh, and of course, uh, Antoine then replies, challenge accepted, and then proceeds to do all of those things. <laughs> uh, of course. <laughs> yes. And the upshot of that is uh, we end up with an actual legit uh, crack of Rastan that d disables the actual copy protection and not just kind of circumventing it through uh, through the Protoss calls. So if you like, it's oh, wow. a, a, a purer form of crack, uh, if, you, if you will. Of Rastan. Uh, so if you know if you're interested in these technical details, the whole thread is really a great read. Uh, so of course we will uh, link to that in the show notes. Very cool. Yeah, it's neat stuff. Uh, this copy protection is something that uh, I never really understood at the time. So it's really cool to see this kind of stuff uh, surface nowadays. I found that the cracking copy protection. I mean, that's obviously way above my skill level, but. Uh, if you're interested in just learning how you know your Apple IIe works on a on a, a level closer to the metal, or you want to brush up on your your assembly language skills, cracking some old software is a great way to do it because it's better than just pulling one of these you know books off the shelf and and reading and trying 
uh, you know, how to, to teach yourself assembly language, which is it's fine, but can be kind of dry. And, and this is uh, if, this for me, um, this sort of thing is a, a lot more challenging and interesting. Definitely. And it's also a great way to learn the gory details of the disk two uh, and similar disk devices. If you uh, want to know more about those, just because copy protection by its very nature exploits quirks and idiosyncrasies and undocumented, you know, effects and so on in disk controllers. Uh, so you'll definitely have to and need to learn all of those to, uh, to crack software. Uh, well, speaking of awesome French crackers and hackers and programmers, uh, I was digging through some unrelated stuff and I stumbled across uh, an interview with uh, the infamous Mr. Z from back in the day uh, of FTA and other related fame. He, uh, there's an interview with him and I think it's maybe written by him. Uh, I'm not sure, <laughs> uh, but in any case, it's a, it's an, uh, the interviewer might be a little biased, <laughs> Yeah, but it's a cool little, uh, little sort of bi biography of sorts. Uh, it's in French. And so I've got a translated Google link for you, uh, that I'll put in the show notes. It's a fun read. Uh, it looks like it's been up for there for a while, uh, that, you know, the webpage, uh, looks like it's straight out of 1998. So if you can kind of, uh, <laughs> uh bear with, uh, the formatting and so on a little bit, it's, uh, it's definitely got some interesting uh, stuff in it. It's uh, perhaps not uh, safe for uh, all family members. Uh, it's, it's a little bit adult in a few <laughs> places, uh, as you know, those old 2GS demos were as well. But uh, yeah, fun read for the uh, 2GS heads like myself. Cool. Uh, lately on the show, we've been finding, um, I don't know if you want to call it highlighting or spotlighting, mentions of of the apple in places that we didn't necessarily expect but uh the other day i forget it's been a while since i found this lincoln so i don't know how i got here i don't know what kind of maze i wandered down to get here but there's a, a little short little bio uh on the moab utah the times independent online newspaper uh about ruth dylan and, and ruth was a um she was the treasurer at the houston area apple users group hog or haug i guess uh, and which was a, a, I think, probably one of the larger groups in the country for a while. There, they had more than a thousand members. I think the, I think there are scans of of that newsletter either on the archive, or maybe on Asimov as well. Uh, but it's nice to see that uh, some old Apple tours are showing up here and there. I've often, I've often wondered what's going to happen with the uh, the lost art of naming uh, computer user groups so that they make something <laughs> amusing as an acronym. I think that was always harder right. with Apple than maybe some of the other computers. I feel like Commodore user groups always had really catchy and pithy acronyms for them. I don't know. Might be my imagination. Well, the best ones were, I, I always thought were the, uh, the ones that were recursive and didn't actually, um, make anything other than the acronym itself. Yes. The, uh, the, the, the Unix uh, heads out there will appreciate that. <laughs> That's sure. right. Yes, this is not a user group name or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, I'm, I see uh, 4 a.m.'s. 4 a.m. stuff is showing up again on the archive. We've mentioned this before. And if you're uh, not reading along, you're definitely missing out. Uh, uh, since um, we kicked off the show with talk or kicked off the news with uh, talk of uh, uh, copy protection cracking, uh, there's a, a neat write up on how 4AM cracked Mr. Do, the Apple II version, over on uh, on the archive. It's uh, pretty in depth. And like I said, if you were interested in learning how your Apple works at, at that level and how developers were able to use the features that was built into the disk two drive to to enhance copy protection and things like that, uh, definitely give this a read because it's, it's easy to follow along. It, Obviously, it, it is going to get into some kind of the more technical stuff. And uh, so if you have an understanding of assembly language, it, it is easier to follow along, but it's not necessary to get through it and, and see that this is an awesome thing that he's doing. And there, I think there are several hundred games now or something that he's cracked. And it's just like one right after the next after the next. It's just boom, 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 boom. So pretty darn cool there, Mr. 4AM or Ms. 4AM, as the case may be. Yeah, 4AM is doing really cool stuff. I hope whoever that is, I hope we find out someday and can thank them in person for uh, both cracking all these things that uh, in a lot of cases, nobody else ever bothered to crack, like the educational stuff, you know, which is great for archiving. And then also just documenting this stuff and teaching those of us who always wondered how it was done, uh, how it was done, uh, which is awesome to read. I love this stuff. 
Yeah, or at least uh, come on the show and let us interview you. We'll, we'll protect your anonymity. <laughs> That's right. We'll do one of those like voice changer filters or something. <laughs> the harmonizer filter. Yeah, it'll be awesome. We'll put you like, we'll backlight you and put your face all in shadow. <laughs> it'll be cool. You'll never know. For an audio podcast. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm going to do that anyway. I'm doing that right now just so you know people don't know who I am. Just for dramatic effect in your house by yourself. <laughs> That's exactly. <laughs> it makes me, puts me in the mood, you know, to talk about oh. Apple II cracking. <laughs> All right. Well, moving right along. Uh, mm -hmm. So Big Mess of Wires uh, has kind of made an impression lately in the Apple II community. We've talked about uh, this site before. Uh, this, uh, I think we talked about them recently because uh, uh, this fellow was bogarting the external 15-pin uh, <laughs> uh, floppy port connectors. And, uh, Jerk. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, for his, uh, he's got this Macintosh uh, solid state storage uh, emulator, uh, floppy emulator called Floppy Emu. And uh, what's cool about this is that he has now added Apple II smart port compatibility to that device. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a pretty big deal because up until now, the uh, Unis disk or UniS disk has been the only solid state storage device that uh, emulates smart port as far as I know. Uh, which is uh, really nice if you want to do, you know, 32 meg ProDOS volumes, things like that, uh, you need a uh, smart port. So uh, it's very cool to have another device in the field that is doing this. Yeah, it definitely makes it easier to emulate um, a hard drive on your, uh, an external hard drive on your Apple IIc, which is something, has been something of a challenge up to now. Yeah, I wonder, uh, there's, uh, there's an open source, or I guess, I don't know if it's open source or at least public domain uh, set of source code for uh, doing smart port uh, emulation. Uh, I found it once when I was researching uh, some, some solid state device stuff, and uh, I think Nishida Radio actually links to it as well. He uh, credits this blob of source code uh, with helping him get smart port support into Unisdisk. So uh, I suspect Big Mess of Wires probably used that uh, because smart port emulation is extremely non-trivial. And uh, if, if someone else can give you a leg up on solving that problem, I'm sure any of us would take it. Uh, but yeah, it looks like a great device. I'm really, really happy to have another one that, uh, that we have to choose from, especially with Nishida Radio, as we talked about last month, being uh, on, on hiatus. So uh, glad to see this. I, I especially appreciate that you don't have to... Uh, it's just a, a patch that you can download onto the card and load up and you've got this new functionality. You don't have to swap out. You don't have to be, you know, not that it's all that difficult, but you forget sometimes what a pain in the butt it is uh, to have to, you know, burn EEPROMs and, and swap out pieces of hardware to get that whatever new functionality. And then you get something like this where it's all just built into the patch and all you got to do is plug the card in and turn the thing on and, and boom, there it is. And that's, that's, uh, that's really neat that, that uh, Mr. Chamberlain has been able to incorporate the updates that way. Yeah, for sure. That was always one of my favorite features of the Unis disk, uh, which is that uh, you can update the firmware just by putting a file on the SD card and you hold down a button while you turn it on and it updates itself. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, and that's especially great with the, uh, you know, you can upgrade, actually upgrade a regular Unis disk to a Unis disk Air using that same approach. Uh, you have to get a special Wi-Fi enabled SD card, but uh, uh, old, uh, old Unis disks can be upgraded that way as well. From an embarrassment of solid state storage devices, uh, we go, we sort of segue into an embarrassment of accelerator boards. We seem to, they seem to be <laughs> multiplying. It's as though someone left a bunch of transwarps in the closet and now that we opened it and now there's lots of them. Every now and then, I guess it, it feels like we have these little explosions of, of neat Apple II hardware that, that show up in, in, in um, and lately, we, you know, we, we've talked a lot about the, uh, the Transwarp GS clones and the stuff that the Reactive Micro and Ultimate Apple II guys are doing. And, but th this other company that we've mentioned, Technowarp, has been teasing us with uh, some cool stuff. And, and the latest one is this. Uh, I think we talked actually about the teaser before this for the it was in the Transwarp accelerator for the the eight bit Apple II. So the the one that, that in the past the original board I think pushed your two E to like three point six megahertz. Well, they've got one coming out now that that'll go seven megahertz and has a five twelve k cache, which used to only be available on the Transwarp two card, and there were only a handful of the original Transwarp two cards made it out on the market before there was uh, the lawsuit. I think between um zip and ae maybe uh but for for whatever reason that functionality uh just never showed back up again until now 
Yeah, this is this is really cool. I mean, seven megahertz, that's really pushing a 2E. Uh, it's neat <laughs> to see that. I, I would actually love to hear from listeners uh, who might have accelerators for the 8-bits. I mean, for the we've talked about this before, but for the 2GS, you know, an accelerator is just a no-brainer. Uh, everything the machine does needs to be done faster, and it's such a, a bottleneck. But the 8-bits, you know, I never actually felt the, the, the need for one uh, because all of the software was just written for, for 1 megahertz. And, uh, you know, the machine didn't ever really feel limited by clock speed. You know, it, it, I felt like it, the machine was more held back by other factors, uh, you know, um, the graphics and, and uh, some of that kind of thing. But, uh, yeah, I'd be curious to see. I mean, I guess this would, you know, this would be great, actually, now that I think about it for, for Geos. Uh, I had... Uh, no, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I had a, I had a Laser 128 uh, EX, which had an accelerator, and it would run at uh, 2 point, I think it was 2.4 or 3.6 megahertz. It had three speeds. And I used to run Geos at the second speed, which was actually quite nice. Uh, the third speed I never used, honestly, it was too incompatible. Everything would crash. Uh, but uh, <laughs> the second speed was really useful for Geos. So aside, but aside from that, yeah, I'm curious to hear what people might be using accelerated 2Es for. I, I think uh, unless you're doing a lot of number crunching, you know, a, a database or spreadsheet in AppleWorks or something, I, I can't... Hmm, I'm not, yeah, I don't, the immediate functions are escaping me because if you're playing games, most of the Apple II games depended on, on the system speed for, for timing. So if you boot up at, if you boot up at seven megahertz, those games are going to run really quick. That's for sure. Yeah, pretty much the first thing I do every time I turn on my 2C plus is reboot it, holding down escape uh, to put it back into one megahertz because almost <laughs> nothing works very well at four megahertz as neat as it is. But uh, yeah. Uh, we shall see. Uh, so speaking of putting things in the closet uh, and seeing what happens, uh, it looks like maybe Ultimate Apple II and... No, wait, what What do these companies used to be called? All right, so I was going to make a joke right there about how we put these two companies in the closet and then they came out and made this blended store thing, but obviously it collapsed because <laughs> I haven't done my homework. So I want to just tell us what's going on, Mike. <laughs> just going to give up completely and throw in the towel. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Abort, abort. So Ultimate... <laughs> uh, Ultimate Apple II, which is uh, Anthony Martino's store, he uh, they were he partnered with um, Henry Corbis for uh, Reactive Micro, and they're now Ultimate Micro. Uh, I think their their catalog is available. It doesn't look like they have everything there yet, uh, and I know that uh, you know they've they've been building the Transwarp prototypes and the the RAM card prototypes. Those I think are probably going to going to show up on eBay at some time at some point. Uh, but it's nice to see that the store is, is the regular store is open again for stuff like you can buy, you know, uh, uh, DRAM chips from them now. And, and they have, uh, looks like they have the Apple II Pi card listed. I don't know if it's available right now. Uh, the EDD4 card is listed there, the 4 Plus, which is that, that hardware card that would go along with uh, Essential uh, Data Duplicator. If, you, if that was your preferred cracking and copying tool, that's a pretty neat uh, thing to have. So check it out. Yeah, it looks like they got a lot of really, uh, really nifty stuff there for sure. Looking forward to uh, giving them my money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, uh, you know, as an impressionable youth, uh, I watched many and an, many an FTA demo on my 2GS, and one of the common themes in those demos was they were very anti tools. They, uh, you know, they had this this sort of uh, moral, if you like, stand that uh, tools... That, <laughs> Down with that, tools. Yes. Tools must go. <laughs> Down with tools. That's right. Yes, I imagine them picketing outside uh, Coop, one, <laughs> well, they, one infinite loop in Cupertino. <laughs> uh, yeah, so they... So anyway, uh, you know, obviously the standpoint was that uh, the this, this Apple provided toolboxes that you were supposed to use were sort of this kind of modern uh, API layer uh, that was uh, allowed you to abstract away a lot of the hardware details. But in doing so, you paid a high price in overhead, and so you could never do the kinds of uh, fast animations and, and graphics and so on that the demo coders did if you had tried to use any sort of uh, toolbox stuff. So. Uh, yeah, with all that, imagine my shock uh, when one day along came uh, Toolset 219, which was the SoundSmith Music Tracker player uh, in official 2GS toolbox form. And it was a it was called Tool 221, and you could drop it into your tools folder, and you could use it in regular GSOS uh, software to play SoundSmith uh, music. And uh, I actually used it a couple of times, and it was super cool. Uh, and I always just thought it was funny and ironic that uh, FTA went and made this tool. 
anyway, the point of all of that <laughs> was that uh, the sort of spiritual and in some cases direct successor of FTA and all of those uh, folks, uh, the modern Ninja Force group, has now released a Ninja Tracker. Uh, and with that has come along Ninja Tracker Tool 221. And so this is another GSOS tool uh, that allows you to play music tracks, music sound files uh, that were created with Ninja Tracker. And uh, this includes, uh, so, you know, Ninja Tracker can convert and, and use Amiga mod files, which is pretty cool. So you can uh, use this tool 221 to play those indirectly as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's documented and there's demo code. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it looks like it's a joint effort between uh, Brutal Deluxe and uh, Olivier Gogel uh, and some of the original FTA members. So it's yeah, this is really cool. I love to see this kind of uh, past and present collaboration. Uh, the copy, copyright screen on it says October 1990 uh, and August 2015, which is really funny. Or sorry, July 2015, which is very funny. Uh, but yeah, this is really cool. And if you're a 2GS programmer, I'm sure you'll make good use of this. Antoine sent, sent us an email, and I find it slightly disturbing that he kicked the email off with Dear Mr. and Mrs. Podcast. <laughs> Not sure how to feel about that. <laughs> well, that, that's how we're known on the street. So, oh, it is. Yeah, okay. Those are our street names. <laughs> that's okay. We get beat up a Mikey lot. Mikey Lash's podcast. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we do. We get our milk money stolen every day. Yeah, we really need tougher, cooler names, maybe. Might be our problem. Uh, all right, what's next on the list here, Mike? Boy. All right, uh, Wade Clark uh, is a name that you may rec uh, recognize from Open Apple Podcasts Past. Jeez, that was a mouthful. Uh, he's a, a prolific uh, interactive fiction author, and he's dug up some of his old adventure games uh, going back as far as 25 years and rescued them uh, from, from old floppies and made them available. Wade uh, was the guy who wrote, uh, I think most famously, the recent one that we would be, that we would be familiar with as a uh, lead light or lead light. I forget how that's pronounced it. He had a big uh, cover splash on juice GS and, and some, uh, and things like that. But I think he competes every, I think he competes annually in the uh, interactive fiction contest contest so you can download all of his entries and and the latest things that he's uh releasing from that website and we'll have the links in the show notes cool oh, i always love to see old stuff getting re-released very nice absolutely well speaking of old stuff getting re-released a bunch of bardstale stuff is happening all of a sudden uh i'm sure like many of our listeners uh, the bardstale series was on the very short list of my favorite games of all time, I played one, two, and three, uh, start to finish, on uh, on the original uh, 8-bit, and uh, yeah, I, it's it's just such a, an amazing uh, series. And there's very few games, honestly, that I ever played start to finish, and uh, these these were among them. Uh, so there's been uh, Bart's Tale has kind of come and gone a couple of times uh, since then. It was remade a few years ago uh, as sort of a spiritual sequel but not really they Ugh. made it into kind of a weird third person actiony kind of thing that didn't really have a lot to do with the original uh so you know that was kind of unsatisfying but uh recently uh sort of a, a more official bard's tale 4 uh has been kickstarted uh and successfully so uh so that's it's going to be much more like uh, an actual sequel to the original trilogy which is very exciting in its own right, but even more exciting for Apple II fans is that our own uh, burger Becky Hyman from uh, the Kansas Fest keynote uh, is involved with this. And she has this company called Old School, which is uh, spelled very amusingly. Uh, she's going to be doing uh, ports of the original trilogy to be included in this Kickstarter. Uh, she's apparently going to be sort of using the 2GS versions of these games as the base, and they're going to, uh, you know, update uh, the update some of the the visuals and so on. But essentially, it's going to be a direct port to modern platforms, and it's going to be included in this uh, Bart's Tale 4 package. So that's super super exciting, and I'm really really looking forward to to seeing how this comes along. Can't wait to get my hands on this, and uh, that looks like that uh, double album soundtrack is going to be cool too that one of the things that i always loved about the bard's tale and, and ultima less so but for whatever reason the bard's tale kind of really spoke to me that the soundtrack is just such a great thing on the 2gs version yeah it really is uh you know it's it's easy to forget that the game was supposed to be about a bard you know that that never really came up <laughs> right. much when you were playing it you know i mean there was a bard on the title screen and there was some nice animation of a 
of a dude playing a harp <laughs> and singing on the title screen. And then it was just an RPG, and it didn't really... Off there, to combat. <laughs> yeah, there was a bard character class that did, wasn't especially useful, and it was all sort of lip service after that. Uh, but uh, yeah, the music kind of helped sell that, I think, on the 2GS. <laughs> So if you missed out on the opportunity way back when to buy the uh, your original copies of the Bard's Tale for your, your Apple II series um, and you felt bad about pirating them, well, feel bad no more. You can get them as part of this. <laughs> yes, I confess to having pirated uh, all three of these games, actually. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure we all did. And, yes. In fact, uh, uh, Bard's Tale 1, uh, I had an interesting... Uh, experience with pirating that I didn't have the crack of it. I uh, I only had uh, an original that I borrowed from a, a generous friend, and I was trying to copy it with Locksmith. And the copy protection I now understand many years later appears to have been the one of the sort that was often used, where they would put uh, a bad track uh, on the disc, and you know the copy protection would know to look for that bad track. And in this case, it was track six, and the track. Uh, wouldn't copy in Locksmith, Locksmith would get an error on it and then proceed and just sort of skip it. So track six would be basically blank and so the uh, uh, the copy would not, uh, uh, wouldn't boot because it would check for a bad track and not find one. And for whatever reason, uh, I, I recopied that disc many, many, many times. I just kept retrying it uh, in Locksmith and I must have attempted the copy 50 or 60 times. And for whatever reason on the <laughs> 69th attempt or something, it actually worked. Uh, to, <laughs> to this day, I have no idea why uh, Locksmith must have just choked in a slightly different way, and it managed to write some kind of garbage <laughs> to track six, which the game then recognized as being the garbage it was expecting. I really I have no idea why, but to this day, uh, it's a mystery, uh, but it worked. Uh, but the catch was the original was damaged in the process. Uh, I don't know what I did if I uh, got it too close to a magnet or something. It's uh, somehow after I made the copy, the original one no longer worked that I had borrowed from my friend. So uh, I did the reasonable thing, uh, you know. So my copy now was effectively cracked somehow uh, through no fault of my own, and so I just punched a notch in the uh, factory disc and copied the my copy back onto it and uh, put a little piece of tape over it and uh, gave it back to my friend. <laughs> <laughs> naturally explaining what had happened and you know offering to replace it and all that uh but uh, yeah they were a good friend so it was all it was all good uh so that was that was that's my funny story there uh yeah and i have a, a bit of a story with bard's tale 3 as well actually because bard's tale 3 had the uh code wheel and uh for, right. for copy yeah, protection I forgot about that, yeah. yeah so it was actually quite easy to copy but then it was unplayable without the code wheel and uh so again i had a very very good friend who was who had the game for the commodore 64 uh and the uh, code wheels were the same of course so they uh, hmm. lent me their copy of the code wheel uh, and they very generously let me pop the little rivet out of the middle uh, it was three layers, uh, three discs stuck together with a rivet. And so I popped that out and made photocopies of the three layers and uh, and then put it all back together uh, so I could have a copy of the code wheel. Uh, yeah, these these were the things we did in our youth. You did it a lot smarter than I did. When I borrowed a, I think I borrowed the Neuromancer code wheel from, from my friend and I did the, you know, set up a, got a piece of graph paper and set up a grid that had all the codes on it and wrote each one down, turn, write them down, turn, write them down rather than take it apart. But you're much smarter than I am. So. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds exhausting. Uh. <laughs> well, the, the, the upside was that it was just one, I just then had to photo, uh, photocopy one sheet to give to all my friends for, yeah. for them to play it. Yeah. Burger Becky has been busy uh, as, as well, not just with Bard's Tale. Uh, this is uh, up on, I think it's up on a2central.com. There's a, a bit about uh, uh, Becky releasing the source code for the 2GS version of Space Ace. It's up on GitHub right now. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Uh, the Space Ace port to the 2GS was quite remarkable. Uh, it's hard to... Probably better than a real game, I think. <laughs> yeah, honestly, yeah. Uh, you know, any any port of that game, it's really just about how good can you make it look because it's not really a game, as we all know. It's just sort of push a direction and see if you die, if not, try again. <laughs> and uh, so it's really just about getting those visuals to translate well. And to translate well, they do. I distinctly remember having the whatever 58 floppies or whatever that game came on. <laughs> it was uh, one of my prize uh, possessions as a 2GS user back in the day. Uh, and the game looks just totally fantastic on it. Uh, so, yeah, very cool to see the uh, source code for that. According to Becky, the uh, code actually compiles and runs using Brutal the, the Brutal Deluxe a65816 assembler and uh, Becky's Python 
text-based build scripts. So pretty darn cool. Wow, that's really cool. She even updated the uh, build pipeline to, to modern tools. That's awesome. Yeah, looks like uh, looks like her appearance at, at Kansas Fest uh, in preparation for that has has motivated her to go through her her archives and and dig around see if she could find anything interesting. And it looks like man, she's found some good stuff. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, as we record this, we're just a couple of short days prior to Kansas Fest. So it's going to be really interesting to see. Uh, maybe she'll bring some surprises. And I'm sure by the time she leaves, she'll have all kinds of new energy to go and dig out even more stuff. So it's going to be uh, awesome to see what happens uh, post K-Fest with Burger Becky. Another name we need to have on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. We we, we should get on that. Who's who's our recruiter here? I don't even know. Gee, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to fire our research department. They really, they're really sandbagging lately. Cut their paychecks. <laughs> Double their hours. That's right. What's what's half of zero? Uh, carry the one. Right. Uh, all right, well, whatever that is, we'll pay them. That. Anyone who's unhappy with this, I will refund triple your money back. <laughs> That's right. Uh, the beatings will continue until morale improves. Exactly. Moving right along, uh, back around to uh, solid state storage. We just cannot seem to get enough of that on this show. <laughs> it's you know, it probably I'm sure it seems like we talk about this stuff all the time, and well, we do. But uh, let's face it, it is it is a really big deal on these old computers to uh, to have modern storage. It really improves the uh, pleasantness of uh, using them. Uh, so there's uh, a new entry in, into this field, uh, a fellow by the name of Ian Kim from Korea, who we've spoken about uh, previously. He's kind of uh, kind of come out of nowhere, as far as us in North America are aware, at least, uh, with the uh, Mockingbird clone that we talked about last month. And uh, now he's got his own uh, SD device. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that, Mike? This is a smart port disk emulator for the Apple IIc and disk 2 emulator for the 2e and 2 Plus. He said, uh, this is a post on uh, Compsys Apple II. Uh, it, this is his, his design was focused mainly on the Apple IIc and it emulates uh, nine hard drives and two floppy drives at the same time. So you can just use slot and drive numbers to access all pretty much, I bet all of your media that you could think of to load on your Apple IIc, you could, you could run through this card. Uh, it has an LCD and a dial controller for image file selection and a serial connection for uh, terminal commands if you want to talk directly to the card. Uh, a lot of these functions are brought over from uh, the internal SD disk to emulator. Very cool. It's a nice looking device too. You know, oftentimes these devices are just a bare board uh, since they're made by, you know, one person in their spare time. Uh, but this actually has a nice uh, enclosure in it. Uh, looks like it's hard to tell from the photos, but it looks like it's maybe about the size of a deck of cards uh, with an SD card slot at the bottom. Really nice looking device. So uh, it looks like they're not quite for sale yet, but uh, we will definitely uh, talk about it here when they are. Yep. He's in the beta testing right now, so it shouldn't be long. Uh, yeah, I kind of kind of want one of these. Yeah, this is uh, on my short list as well. I think it looks like <laughs> it looks like wow. I mean, having all all of these sort of parallel uh, devices at the same time is is super cool. I mean, you could just have every piece of software ever uh, all at once. I, I was actually thinking for the first time with the two C, we actually have a, a surplus of of devices with overlapping functionality. So I'm going to look at my two C and I'm going to look at the these this and the Unis disk and and and, and um. Uh, what's the um, big mess of wires card, and I'm just not going to know which one to plug in today. <laughs> yeah, it, it wasn't so long ago that the Apple IIc, you were just sort of like, eh, shrugged. There was nothing you could do. There was no, no devices that would let you do it. You know, you needed a card slot for anything like this, but now there's just tons of them. And uh, and all with, I, I like how each one is kind of a unique spin on it. You know, you've got the SD Floppy 2 from, uh, from Plamen in Bulgaria that's very compact and very you know tidy and then you've got uh, it doesn't you know only does disk 2 and then you've got the unis disk which has the wi-fi support and also does smart port but it's a little bigger and doesn't have a case now we've got this guy which uh, is you know nice looking this guy's also got the uh, serial port which is nice uh, it's got a series of uh, terminal commands you can do so you can talk to it uh, through you know from your your desktop or your modern computer through the serial port and you know configure and control it that way so uh, lots of yeah really neat stuff going on now the 2C won't have to feel bad when it goes out to play with the other Apple IIs. <laughs> That's right. Uh, they're all jealous of how it looks anyway. <laughs> That's true. Uh, David Finnegan has been busy, busy, busy as usual. Uh, we we talked a while back about his release of Marina? Marina? Marina, I think, I think, yeah. I think it's Marina, the 8-bit uh, the, the 
Apple II IP stack. I still can't believe that I'm saying that as, <laughs> and that it's a real thing, but it is. And now he's updated it, and it has uh, the the Berkeley Sockets API. He said it's uh, not complete yet, but uh, it's in progress. So it's a it's a a a live uh, I guess project. I don't, I don't know if I like the word live there. It's it's a thing that's still breathing and, and not <laughs> some dead project from 20 years ago that's half finished or isn't going to be improved again. So, yeah, it's it's great to, to have these the stuff that's released and the developers are sticking around to continue to improve and bug fix and uh, uh, it just blows my mind. Yeah, I think uh, inactive development might be what you were uh, looking for there. Oh, there, there you go, <laughs> yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah, I love how uh, TCP IP on the 8-bits went from something that everyone thought was probably impossible to... Uh, existing and then having DNS and now having the Berkeley Sockets API in the space of a couple of months. Fantastic. Yeah, and it's all uh, all done in assembly language, so it's uh, fast and, and efficient. And I haven't experimented uh, with this yet myself, but the reports that I'm reading are all all positive. So it looks like he's uh, on track for, for a great thing. Yeah, very cool. Well, uh, let's see. We've been talking a lot about Ninja Force this month, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, Jesse Blue once again. What's what's he been up to, Mike? Oh, uh, so yeah, so he contacted me actually uh, a little while ago and said, I have these old newsletters from, from the news groups that I used to go to. Uh, if, if I scan them, would you put them online? And I did, so you can find copies of his uh, Apple Bytes. Apple Bytes was the official newsletter of the, oh boy, Kaiser Schlautern <laughs> Apple Users Group, <laughs> Apple Users Association, and the, the Rammstein Apple Computer Club. These are two Germany-based English language user groups, uh, as well as uh, a whole bunch of the uh, Arnog, I'm just going to call them that, which is a, another uh, English language user group based in, in Germany. A lot, a lot of the later ones that he sent me from like 93 or 94, there's a ton of Mac content in there, but there's still some good Apple II stuff. So Jesse, thank you for contributing your newsletters and letting us post them. For sure. It's always great to have more stuff scanned. More, 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 more. Scan, 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 scan. <laughs> uh, so this is an interesting item. Uh, many of us use modern uh, ergonomic keyboards at work or uh, at home, and uh, these are uh, often of the uh, split type where you've got a separate little section for each hand, sometimes each one at its own uh, jaunty angle, which uh, the experts tell us is good for the carpal tunnel and other repetitive stress conditions. Uh, so here's one uh, that looks like it's been made with uh, Apple II key switches. How did you find this one, Mike? I have no idea how this popped up uh, on my radar. Again, I, I see these things come through on my, uh, probably some Google feed, um, and they get dumped into, I, I read through it and dump it in our spreadsheet, and then we talk about it two months <laughs> later. Uh, so I don't know how I got here, but this is the, uh, uh, I think the company's name is Butterfly Keyboard, and they're, they have made this thing called the Model 01, and it's, so yeah, it's definitely this futuristic, the, the keyboard is not just split, but the halves are angled in, and they're on this night, nice wooden these nice thick wooden plane they're almost like cutting board things um, and it looks like if you were if you if you lay your hands just right you pretty much don't have to move your palms all that much to get your fingers to almost everywhere that they need to go on on these keys but the interesting thing here is in the write-up they mentioned that they're they're using the same mechanical switches that were found on the apple II. Now, I, I don't think that that means that they went and stripped out apple II keyboards for this I, at least i hope they didn't uh, so, but if you, if you want that old familiar click feel, uh, I bet this will give it to you. Yeah, this is neat. I mean, I, I, I can't speak to the uh, actual ergonomic benefits of this particular keyboard. Uh, if, if I were to say the wooden base looks a little too thick to me, but, uh, it's certainly a nice looking keyboard and, uh, to get that feel back would be pretty cool. I mean, just before we were recording, I've been frantically working on something I'm supposed to show at uh, Kansas Fest in three days uh, that isn't working yet. And uh, so I've been doing a lot of typing on my Apple IIc keyboard and it's such a nice keyboard uh, and it's uh, easy to forget that. You know, we went through a whole series of really terrible keyboard feels there in the 90s with PC clones and, and so on. And uh, one of the reasons I've kind of stuck with Apple over the years is that one thing they've always taken seriously is the feel of their keyboards. You know, modern PowerBook keyboards feel so much better than their uh, contemporary counterparts in, in other brands. And I think that's always been true. So, you know, if you were longing for that uh, feel of, a, of an Apple II keyboard, this might be worth looking at. And if you don't like the feel that much, you can at least console yourself with the fact that the left half glows blue and the right half glows a violet color. 
That's pretty cool, I think. Uh, I don't see a price listed in the article uh, on the page that I'm looking at, and I'm not seeing a link back to Butterfly Keyboard's webpage. I don't know if that means it's not available yet, but um, I, I kind of want one just to play with it. <laughs> yeah, maybe that means if you have to ask, you can't afford it. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these, uh, these, if, these, these sort of bespoke custom, you know, uh, right. <laughs> ergonomic keyboards are frequently not inexpensive. If, if you have to ask for our webpage, you can't afford it. <laughs> yeah. It does look nice, though. Uh, you know, yeah. Wacky colors and all. All right, moving uh, right along. Uh, what do we got going on here, Mike, with uh, you and OneUp is in the news again? Yeah, so all this hardware... Um... All this new hardware and, and toys to play with doesn't come without some software to play with as well. Uh, this is, um, I don't think any of these are brand new releases, but uh, Ewan Wineup continues to update the software that, that he uh, wrote and supported. This is uh, SAM 2 is now version 2.0.5, just a minor bug fix. Uh, Spectrum is has finally moved uh, to 2.5.4. I think it was at 2.5.3 for a long time. Uh, there's a bug fix and a couple of minor adjustments were made. This, uh, he says Spectrum is now released as a standalone bootable uh, 2MG disk image. Uh, so you don't have to deal with floppy disks anymore. I, I think for a while there when you bought them from Syndicom, you either got them on the floppies, which meant that you had to have a real 2GS or uh, a CD, in which case you had to then deal with getting the images into an emulator, which great if you're on a Mac, not so great if you're on a PC. So... Uh, but now the 2MG disk image with, that's tailor-made for emulation, you can just drag it right into. Actually, I don't know what's. I, I don't use. I don't emulate on um, on Windows for for the 2GS. I guess that would be like kegs or X kegs or something like that. I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, he, the other thing that, that um, he updated was Gazelle. That was his. That was an 8-bit telecommunications program that was originally commercially sold in the UK way back in 1987. That he wrote, and it's now available f uh, for download with the PDF manual updates, etc., from his website. Cool. This might be the excuse I need to play with Spectrum. It's it's such a neat thing. I mean, it's it came along, you know, so late, uh, you know, in the BBS era, you know, sort of at the tail end of the 8-bits, and when the uh, IBM, you know, ANSI graphics were taking over. Uh, and mm -hmm. you know, I think uh, a lot of us eight bits uh, kind of got left in the dust with that. We couldn't uh, couldn't render those those characters, and uh, Spectrum allowed you to to do that. But uh, by then, uh, BBSs were kind of on the way out, and you know, had access to the internet through school by then. So I never really got on board the Spectrum train. But uh, it definitely looks like really cool software. Yeah, and uh, of course, thanks to Ewan for continuing to support your products. For sure. Well, uh, regular viewers of the uh, Apple II Enthusiasts Facebook group will no doubt be familiar with Mr. Javier Rivera. Uh, he's n famous for being the master of all things RetroBright, and uh, he's mm -hmm. also lately become famous for doing uh, LCD monitor conversions. Uh, these things are really cool. He takes, you know, broken old plastic shells uh, from monitors, uh, Apple II monitors, and puts uh, matching LCDs in them. And uh, the end results are really, really nice. Uh, I'm, I really like uh, looking at these. So he's, uh, he's done a 2C, most famously. Uh, we talked about that, in fact, on the show here a while back. And uh, now he's done a 2E as well. And it looks like he's now offering a service where he will convert these things, uh, which is pretty cool. Yeah, so the, this, uh, this two, the 2E monitor, the color monitor 2E has a, a curved screen. And obviously when you slip a flat screen there, that's not going to, to sit perfectly flush. And it's just going to annoy OCD people such as myself. So Javier has come up with a solution for that. And he'll do the conversion for you if you want. Yeah, and in fact, uh, with the uh, 2E monitors that have the little tilting bezel that we all remember, uh, he'll uh, he, the way he does it, it actually preserves that, so you can still do the the little you know two degrees of tilt or whatever the silliness that it had that no one ever used. Mm. Uh, so that's that's kind of a nice feature. Yeah, he does this cool like uh, custom fit foam uh, insert that uh, kind of fills out the curved area and, and matches it to the LCD. Really, really nice work. Yeah, that that little tilt thing always felt like a very Steve Jobs unnecessary thing, you know, like, really, dude, this, I, I know you're into style, but this is a little too far. You, you're sitting there and, and, oh, my God, I can't see the monitor. Click, click. Oh, yeah. look at that. It's so brilliant and beautiful. Come on. Yeah, I used to fidget with that when I was using, uh, I didn't have that monitor at home, but we had them at school and I used to fidget with it because uh, it was sort of fun. But <laughs> Back and just, forth, yeah. I don't know anybody who derived any actual uh, useful function from that feature. It's very strange. 
there was one monitor that took it a step further, the Apple Color Monitor 100, which was mainly for the Apple III, but it had a card that you could plug in and use with your Apple IIe. That had, it was motorized. You didn't move it with your hand. It had a little switch on the side, and it would move it. You, this, you could hear a little motor, and the screen would move move magically by itself. So. That is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but and, and all over this thing in, in the manual was like, do not push on this yourself because if you like pushed it all, it would strip them all, it would strip it out. Then the, the screen would just like sag forward and push on it and kind of sag back forward. It's really sad. Yeah, I think I remember you talking about that on drop three inches. And uh, yeah, if you yep. push on it manually, it would strip the plastic gear inside, break it, and mm -hmm. then it would never yep. work ever again. And so every one <laughs> so that you fragile. every one that you try to buy online, they're always broken because everybody did that at some point. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's that's an awesome design. Uh, but in any case, uh, with uh, with Javier's monitor conversion, it's also worth noting that uh, you know they get about thirty pounds lighter after this because there's no yeah, no, no big power supply, no, no big CRT, glass tube no in there. Yeah. <laughs> so honestly, this is worth doing for your monitors at home. Just you know, if you're someone who doesn't have your retro computers out all the time, if you put them away and take them out a lot, this could be great just to make your monitors so much lighter. Well, and some of these, a lot of these, you know, this is a thing that we talk about a lot. A lot of the, the these old monitors are beginning to go. You know, we we've been focusing a lot on the the RGB ones because those those seem to be harder to get a hold of. But even even these old color monitor two E's, the composite style input on these things gets fuzzy and the colors kind of go off after a while. And yeah, you can go in there and mess around trying to adjust the guns yourself, or you can just put a brand new LCD in here and fool your friends and look brand new. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, I'm sure the purists are cringing, but I have to say Javier's, <laughs> Javier's monitors look great, so I would be inclined to do that. If you have a monitor that doesn't work and is just sitting there taking up space in your garage, I, I sorry purists, I, <laughs> I would say fix it with this yep yeah and it's worth noting you know if people are shy about destroying a, a monitor uh it's worth noting that millions of them were made so there are still right. plenty of them out there i'm sure uh yeah but yeah that does definitely definitely does not apply to, to two gs monitors if anyone destroys a working two gs monitor i will personally come over there and kick you in the shins and i will record it and put it on youtube <laughs> you've, you've all been warned all right, moving <laughs> along. Speaking of people that need to get kicked in the shins, uh, let's uh, let's talk Halt and Catch Fire. Uh, we've all we've been talking about it a lot lately since it's back in, uh, in back in production. We're looking at season two right now. We're about halfway through as we record this, and uh, you know they've broken our hearts, Mike. They they finally, after teasing us with various eight bits in the background, they finally picked an eight bit computer to feature in every episode with multiple sitting on everybody's desks. And what did they choose? They chose. Commodore. Well, the, the server room is the uh, stacks of the, the IBM 5150s, but they're using. Uh, I is it slut? Is it slut shaming to say that Halt and Catch Fire is a dirty, dirty whore for flaunting itself with these Commodores in front of us like this? It might be. I'm not sure, but uh, yeah. It's, okay. Well, then I might have to edit that out. Yeah. <laughs> if for some reason there are Commodore people listening to this, uh, yeah, I'm talking to you, Flack. Uh, then you're gonna love these, uh, Mr. Whalen. You're gonna love these latest episodes because it's yeah, Commodores everywhere. And to be fair, it makes sense. I mean, you know, the the the, the side uh, the the plot is involving this online gaming service, and uh, so obviously. Obviously, Commodore would be the platform of choice for such a service. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's lots and lots of them now on the screen. And some of the screenshots, I think, you know, obviously I don't know that much about the Commodore BBS days, but I believe when you log into Mutiny's system, I think it's the Q-Link menu that you're looking at. I think that's what that was mm. called. Mm -hmm. uh, but okay, so yeah, I guess we'll have to just look the other way in the Commodore thing. But <laughs> I'm really liking what they've done with the show this season. They've kind of just... You know, they, they, they made that the giant computer and then like in the first episode or two, they, they killed it off. Mm -hmm. All right, that's done. The, the company sold off and Cameron has moved on to this awesome game development software. And they've, they've also got suddenly out of nowhere, there's chat room communication software kind of like piggyback backing on and, and watching, uh, is it Joe, the slick, cool, smooth guy? Mm -hmm. He, you know, he's kind of been humbled a little bit. He was working down in data processing for a while, but he sort of found a way to come back and he still seems like, hey, maybe I'm just as arrogant as I ever was. But the stories feel more realistic and a lot less kind of the, the weird spacey might be a little bit drugged out stuff that they were doing at the end of uh, last season. I know Gordon was high on coke and stuff and that does weird stuff to your brain, but these stories feel like uh, ones that I can relate to more and the people are people that um, feel realistic and that I can like and root for. 
Yeah, I agree with that. It's kind of nice that they're kind of away from their fictional computer that they were building. Uh, and now they're just focusing more on the stories of startup companies and so on, uh, because that sort of gives them license to just start using real retro computers, which is cool. I mean, even if they're talking about Commodores and PCXTs and whatnot, it's neat that they're using the mm -hmm. real hardware and they've got it on screen uh, and they're talking about it, you know, like they know what they're talking about. So they've clearly done some research uh, as well, which is, it's neat. Uh, it's neat to see that. And uh, I think, uh, you know, I've been looking like all of us, I'm sure I've been analyzing uh, obsessively the uh, the hardware that they're showing. And I, th I feel like a lot of the screenshots are probably fake. Uh, yeah, uh, I think so. Yeah, especially the um, the games that Mutiny is developing when they show them. Uh, the tank one really, really looks like Atari 2600 Combat to me, so I have a strong feeling that might be what they're showing there, but uh, hard to say. Anyway, it's it's cool. It's interesting that you that you mentioned the, the 2600 because you keep seeing in the background of all these like uh, Commodores running, there's like Atari boxes all over the place. Mm -hmm. and I, But I don't see a lot of Atari machines and I'm wondering if they like bought some to try and get them on the show and they didn't work or something. <laughs> they said, well, just put the boxes there and at least make it look like something. Yeah. Um, I, there, there was a scene and I forget the episode, but I thought it was really neat where uh, one of the game players calls up because he's, he's stuck at a puzzle in the game and he's mad because he thinks it's a bug. And rather than just giving the answer, Cameron kind of walks him through the logic of, of let's, let's have you solve this yourself. And I remember uh, there were times when I would call Infocom and and go, I can't get through this, and I would get the same sort of treatment where they're these people are fans uh, of the games that they make and they like playing them, and so when someone calls up to talk about it, they they enjoy it. it it's um and it, it it was neat to see that translated over into the show so well. Yeah, they're they're really capturing. I feel the uh, the feel of those early '80s, you know, software game especially startups that you know it does mutiny feels very much like you know sierra online would have felt or you know uh, lucas arts would have felt in the early days uh you know i think they've they've really nailed that uh the fact that yeah when they call tech support uh they get the owner of the company <laughs> which right. is uh, not very much unlike uh sierra online and, and and its ilk back in the day in fact it's timely since we just had uh uh, since we just had Lane Nooney on the show to talk uh, talk about Sierra, uh, it's uh, and, yeah. and broader bund and so on. They these companies uh, very much had that same same sort of feel that, that we're seeing in Mutiny. Now, my wife did bring up an interesting point. She's a big fan of the show too. That by the time this publishes, the season will pro probably be over or close to it. But it took them, I think, what four or five episodes into season two, and we've jumped ahead five or six years. You know, how long is it going to be before we're Windows ninety eight? things like that i uh there, there does seem to be a, a lot of accelerated jumping forward that that maybe i would like them to back off and develop the stories a little bit so yeah the timeline's a little wonky uh you know it, when they started out it felt like they were kind of in 1983 somewhere in there uh but now it's all now they're it's i don't know i guess they're supposed to be sort of in the late you know 88 something like that but uh mm -hmm. the prevalence of the Commodores is strange. That would put it more in 85. But now they're also talking about broadband in the show, which is it's much too early for that. So yeah, they're, they're definitely playing fast and loose with the timelines here. It's a, it's a bit strange. All right, well, let's uh, let's move on. Uh, let's talk about uh, Lonnie Mims. Yeah, so we haven't talked to Lonnie here on the show, but I recognize the name at least most recently from helping David Grealish establish the VCF Southeast, and he was the one that supplied the uh, the Apple One and a bunch of other Apple ephemera and, and models for their. They had this this neat little pop up walkthrough museum, and I know he's got like two working Apple Ones, something like that, and a bunch of uh, of other stuff. and And he has been profiled in the New York Times. Uh, their online section. Uh, the headline is an Apple aficionado with a million dollar vintage collection. And I don't know if it's actually a million dollars or not, but there's a little video. It's about three and a half minutes long where Lonnie takes you through kind of the, the stuff that he's collected over the years. And and um, it's uh, it's fun to, fun to watch that. Yeah, the video is really nice. One of my favorite parts of the video is they show an Apple IIe running that uh, demonstration software learning where it teaches you how to use the keyboard uh, teaches you you know that the uh, the the return key is what you push when you t want to tell the computer you're done and you're ready for it to do its thing or whatever i i just i, I love that that disc uh, <laughs> i used to play it sometimes just for fun now lonnie is a little bit uh cautious with his collection he's, he's got models that he won't turn on because he's afraid that uh, they will turn into quote smoke bombs mm -hmm. but uh 
you know, and, and apparently he hasn't been listening to our show because if he had, he would know that you, you just need to, you know, recap everything and you'll be just fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm of two minds on that. I mean, on the one hand, I get it. You know, this stuff's <laughs> really, really valuable. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, this stuff's meant to be used and it's a bit like collecting old cars. You know, there's two types of collectors. There's the ones that put them on a rotating pedestal and never touch them and there's the ones that that drive them to the car show every week and hang out with their friends and the latter i'm much more interested in because yeah these things were not meant to be art you know and sit on sit still and and slowly rot away they were meant to be used uh and you know if you do it carefully there's no reason these things shouldn't be perfectly usable uh for a long time to come uh, if you take care of the capacitors and so on and, you know, take care of the power supplies. Uh, now, having said that, if I had an Apple One, I don't think I would turn it on either. <laughs> <laughs> well, Apple One, maybe not, but uh, it sounds like he's got a bunch of stuff that he doesn't want to turn on. But I get that. It's, you know, it's, it's his collection. He can do what he wants with it. So. Yep. To each their own. Well, Mike, let me ask you a question. Ugh. If No, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> if I asked you to shoot me in the head rather than talk about this <laughs> next news item, would you do it? <laughs> no, just because I want to watch. I want to hear you squirm over over Skype as we talk, as we continue to talk about the Steve Jobs movie that we just can't get away from. Yeah, this is the eighteenth <clears throat> month in a row we've had a news item about a Steve Jobs movie, and you know, and it's not going to be re- not going to be released until November. So we got many more months to talk about this stuff. That's great. Uh, it's, it's it's not as <laughs> probably gonna have a new co-host when she walks off when I bring this up next month. Yeah, it's not as it's not as, it's not as though it's our podcast and we can choose to talk about whatever we want. Oh wait, That's it right. is, and yet we keep talking about these Jobs movies. All right, well, long story short, there's there's another trailer. Yes, there's a new official trailer that's been released, and you and I mentioned that Michael Fassbender didn't have the resemblance to Jobs as as much as the other people who have played him in the past and but at least from the trailers that i'm seeing that doesn't i wasn't looking at this going where's jobs uh fastbender is a great actor in the other stuff that he's done so yeah well i guess we'll just have to wait and see and continue to talk about it until then right i know that uh i know that they did interview was about about the uh, trailer and he said he, i think he said something like job seems a lot more mean in this than he really was but i figure it's a trailer and they're trying to make him look like as much of a jerk as possible because that's how the public perceived him yeah well and it's also how seemingly everybody except was who worked with him also perceived him (laughs) so i I think (laughs) that might be a a relatively fair uh, characterization but we shall see right all right well enough about jobs uh let's move on and talk about uh our favorite apple co-founder shall we (laughs) woos We like Woz, and we know you do too. It's Woz News. It's Woos. <sighs> All right, we made a bumper for it and everything, and there it was. Uh, so uh, this, this is an interesting article, speaking of their uh, relationship, uh, Woz and Jobs. Uh, Woz has uh, written uh, a column on Yahoo uh, to let us know that uh, we have Jobs all wrong. Well, as you just mentioned, uh, Quinn, I, I think we probably... Uh, I think that Waz's perception of jobs is probably a lot different than the rest of the world. Now, as as an outsider who never met the guy, never met any of his family, don't know him, um, I kind of trust that Waz knows better than I do, but maybe Waz doesn't know better than other people who actually did know jobs and work with him in, in the later years because you know Watts has been away from was away from apple for a long long time when in what and when jobs came back there was i think still a long time where they didn't really spend much time together so this is all speculation i don't know <laughs> yeah and i'm sure you know the was is sort of uh got some rose tinted glasses there a little bit as well but uh Sure. Well, and the thing about him is if you ask him questions, he, he's a great enough guy. He'll answer everything you ask. And and because this movie is a big thing, the press is asking him. And so that's what we're getting. <laughs> All right. So uh, moving right along, uh, it looks like uh, Waz and Spock were on stage together. This is pretty, this is pretty <laughs> amusing. Yeah, I like this one a little bit better uh, than the Jobs talk, actually. Back in 2012, um, is it, is, I think Waz interviewed... Nimoy, or maybe it's the other way around, but it's a pretty awesome video that happened at the, uh, this happened somewhere. Anyway, watch it. It's cool. <laughs> uh, very professional tonight, folks. We're, uh, <laughs> we're really crushing it here. Uh, <laughs> all right. So uh, hypothetically, Mike, if I wanted a slightly creepier dead-eyed version of Waz, where would I go for that? <laughs> oh, my God. 
Well, you might go to the uh, Madame Tussauds Wax Museum in, in London because Waz, a likeness of Waz is going to uh, appear there shortly if it hasn't already. Well, perfect. <laughs> that is that is exactly uh, what I might want to see, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was wondering if, if you know, with the, with the run-up for the, the new crappier Terminator movie that just came out, uh, Schwarzenegger, I guess, went actually went there himself and stood in for his wax figure. And when people got close, he would come to life and shake their hands and talk to them and stuff. And then fr just watch them freak out. Uh, and I wonder if Waz will do something like that. That would be cool. <laughs> I really hope so. I'm going to go there and ask <laughs> it to sign my Apple to C plus and see what happens. <laughs> Sir, he's not doing anything. I keep holding it. And he's not signing. <laughs> I want my money back. This place is terrible. Uh, all right. That, that, that's a strange news item. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it is, it is woos. <laughs> it is woos. Yes. Woos <laughs> is our silliest segment, I think. Uh, so as we all know, Waz is moving to Australia soon. So it looks like he's going to need to sell his house here. Is that right? Yeah, actually the, the house has been on the market a few times. Um, I don't know if you were on the show or if it was the previous host when the last time we talked about it, the, it was originally listed for, I think 4.2 or $4.3 million dollars. Uh, didn't sell, um, came off the market, went back on the market recently, uh, and back on, uh, uh, in June, it sold for 3.9 million and we'll have, we didn't talk too much about it in, in the previous show. It's just why I kind of wanted to mention it here. What's what I like most about this because, and, and now the person who bought this house didn't buy it from was, there's been a, there was a, a buyer or two between, but he designed it and, and the house is basically almost as he designed it, I guess they kind of made it less eighties, <laughs> uh, but he made it kind of for his kids, which is cool because that means that there is a full size um, fossil cave in the house. <laughs> The, the Chicago Tribune has a, their, has a, an archive of their old articles, and this dates back to 1990, and it goes into a lot more detail because uh, about the house than, than the articles that you see now. He talks about, uh, they talk to the, the builder and, and what they had to, to do, and um, the, the cave, it said, uh, took three months to build, and it was a crew of 70 workers, and, and there's like spider webs all over the entrances to the place. And there's a video on YouTube where there's a walkthrough of the house and the cave, which I think is, if you're interested in Waz's history and that kind of thing, it's definitely a, a fun thing to see. Hmm. I actually had no idea that he had a fossil cave in the basement of his house. That's that, that's a new one. <laughs> yes, uh, in 1990, this it was for he. I guess he's three kids: Jesse, seven, Sarah, five, and Gary. I, I don't think they're that old anymore. Yeah, probably not. Uh, those were probably the luckiest kids ever, I guess. So it's I find it interesting to see how uh, Waz and other sort of luminaries from that time uh, feel about uh, kind of some of the modern social issues that come with computing, uh, and often because often those issues just didn't exist uh, in in their day. And one of those uh, examples is digital privacy, which is very much in the news nowadays. You know, with the NSA and the power of the internet making it uh, so much easier to uh, spy on all of us and you know, uh, things like Google and Facebook kind of manipulating our uh, personal information on a daily basis for fun and profit. Digital <laughs> privacy is a hot topic. Uh, so uh, Waz has weighed in on this, and I find this pretty interesting. Uh, he uh, is a big fan of uh, Edward Snowden, uh, in fact, calls him a total hero. And uh, honestly, I'm inclined to agree, but uh, that's a topic for another show. <laughs> so yeah, Waz is a big champion of digital privacy. Uh, but what's interesting about this this post is that uh, he's kind of resigned about it. It sounds like he's decided that digital privacy is probably a lost cause, uh, and uh, you know we may have already lost that battle. And I think he's probably right about that as well, especially with you know you talk to uh, teenagers nowadays, uh, and they aren't nearly as concerned about privacy. They're sort of growing up in a world where digital privacy is not really a thing anymore. And I think once you're raised in that environment, then you don't care anymore, and it's not an issue that you care about. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting article nonetheless. If you ask Waz questions, he will answer them. And uh, the great thing about him is is I, there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, – he seems to be just very honest and open about his opinions even even when – fortunately, people love him enough that he's able to say some, say things sometimes that Apple, <laughs> Apple fans and the, the loyal let him get away with that maybe others wouldn't. But um, it's nice to hear because, yeah, I, I tend to agree with you and, and a lot of other people that, that – 
uh, Snowden did the right thing. I'm sure, you know, send your hate mail to Quinn. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I like his little write-ups. I like that they're thoughtful and, and he's at least aware of the world around him. Some, some of these celebrities get so insulated that they don't, they tend to forget their name if they don't, if their handler doesn't tell them in the morning. So I don't know. All right. Well, that's all we've got for woos this month. Uh, let's go ahead. Yeah, and... I feel a little woozy. Yeah, oh, no. How long See have you been waiting to there. say that? <laughs> oh, man. You have no idea. I just got to like it. Stickies everywhere. <laughs> say woozy, say woozy. And I got gotcha. you. Mike Mingettis plays the long game, folks. He created this whole segment so that months <laughs> later he could make that joke. <laughs> it's the, I run the long con and it paid off in spades. Uh, all right. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, not talk about eBay as we do not on this show. Look, rare, Steve Jobs. Look what we found on eBay. We talk every now and then about the uh, Rev Zero Apple IIs when they show up on eBay. There's one that's been listed. Uh, it's actually been listed a few times um, and not sold. There, but there, I don't think there've been any bids on it because the starting price is sixteen thousand dollars. I think you're taking the wrong approach here, folks. If you'd start with a low bid, you probably would get that sixteen thousand. But nobody's going to start out with that. It is appears to be a, a Apple II serial number one nine six two on the case. I don't see the board number in any of these. Uh, maybe the, the pictures, at least on are, as they're rendering in my browser, are kind of messed up. I'm seeing like a third of them. They do have some very large pictures there if you can view them. There are two uh, disk, two floppy drives. Uh, looks like one of them is the only serial number I can see is 6370, a little bit higher. Than, it's not a triple digit. It is in the four digits. But it does have the rainbow cable and uh, there's a couple of pictures with the case off the top and it does have the original first version of the Datanetix keyboard in there. So I'm um, kind of beaten up, but it is still nice to see. Oh, and it, the other thing that, that makes these things valuable is the, the A2M001 original power supply is in there and that, that's serial number 2087. Hmm. Well, that is pretty cool. I mean, yeah, 16,000, that seems pretty optimistic for this. But uh, yeah, I mean, RevZero Apple IIs are definitely shooting up in value, so uh, I won't won't be surprised if they start going for this pretty soon. Uh, keeping that old power supply in there is pretty brave. Uh, I wonder if it's been recapped or anything internally. Yeah, I, I've seen a lot of the the owners of these uh, the RevZeros will take those out and just put them on the shelf, and if they're going to use it, you know, put a newer one in there that they know works, mm. and keep it around in case they ever want to sell it. Yeah, that's smart. And maybe that's what happened here. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Well, uh, yeah, speaking of uncommon uh, Apple IIs, this next eBay item is pretty neat. Uh, you know, we've talked in the past about uh, weird Apple II clones the world over and uh, other countries where Apple's legal uh, reach wasn't very good uh, had their own <laughs> clones. Uh, you don't think this is a legal clone? Yeah, I suspect not. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, I am not a lawyer, but uh, this looks a little sketchy to me. Uh, yeah, this is a Numerex Apple II Plus clone. And uh, like many of the clones, what's interesting about it is that it's pretty ugly. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sure it's functional, but yeah, they've decided to cram a disc two and a monitor side by side into kind of a unified case that sticks out wider than the base. It's, it's very strange looking, this thing. It appears that the base part of the, the actual CPU case part of it is, is an actual Apple II Plus case. We, uh, there's a shot of the, of the bottom. You can see the original Apple sticker on it. So I think it, that piece of it came from Cupertino, probably like you know we implied, maybe not so legally. But the the badge on the on the front, the top, the Apple II Plus badge has been pried off and replaced with a Numerex badge. The top of it looks like one of those old luggables, um, where maybe like a not compact, but maybe like Corona. I think there was like a maybe um, Orange made, made one of these, a company called Orange. Maybe that's what this is. Uh, it, it's, it looks like they've taken one of the luggable tops and just thrown away the attachable face keyboard that normally covers the monitor and the drives on that and then routed all the, routed all the um, video electronics and the drive electronics through this box. It's, and a very interesting hack. Yeah, that sounds about right. It definitely looks like what they've done here. Uh, very uh, creative, I guess. Uh, but yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a very ugly looking thing. Uh, nevertheless, we will link to it in the show notes. 
I think that that monitor and drive is actually, that's a screwed to the Apple II. I, I don't think that that's just sitting on top of it. So this is like one big clunky unit, which I, I think would make it a nightmare to open it up if you actually wanted to get into the Apple II, unless I guess maybe if you just picked up the top piece and the lid came out. I, very strange. I, I'm not sure what they were going for here, uh, but I hope they achieved it. Yeah, the design seems to defeat the main purpose or main feature of the Apple II case, which is that you can pop the lid off easily and, and work on the inside. <laughs> mm. Strange beast, this thing. Mm, yes. All right, I think that wraps it up for eBay. So let's go on to everyone's favorite segment, Weird Gaming. You know Choplifter, you know Load Runner, but do you know this? It's time for a weird game. Woohoo! So Mike, why don't you start off this month? I picked NORAD by SDS. This was one of my favorite games from that era that I played on the Apple II all the time that I had completely forgotten about until recently I saw it in some article. And it's sort of, I don't want to say it's its a Missile Command clone. The game mechanic is the same. You start on a, a, a globe, uh, sort of a, a 3D arc globe where uh, these nuclear missiles come over uh, the, the Arctic from, of course, the evil Soviet Union and you press buttons to launch your rockets to shoot down their incoming their their incoming nuclear attack and that's pretty much all there is to it but the graphics are uh, to me anyway you know i i know that there are missile command clones on the apple II, but this is um a lot more involved it's got a lot of great sounds and the game play is re is repetitive but not anno annoyingly so and at least for me I, I remember this being very addictive and i had a great time playing it so uh, if you're like me and you've forgotten about it go check it out again it's fun yeah, I was super glad to see this in the show notes because I had also totally forgotten about this game and I played the heck out of this thing. Uh, it is, it's really fun. It's so <laughs> simple. You know, the controls, it's just, you're just pushing the mm -hmm. number keys. Uh, but it's it's really fun. And yeah, the sound uh, was really great. And yeah, and it's, yeah, this was a fun little game. Um, and uh, what's also amusing about it is that they took the time to, the, the top of the screen has this big banner that says NORAD and, and the A in NORAD is like an apple, but without the bite taken out of it, the apple logo. Uh, so for some reason they decided to really brand this thing as an apple sort of game. And it sort of emphasizes one of the great ironies of the Apple II, which is that uh, the machine itself cannot render all of the colors that are in the logo that Steve Jobs put on there <laughs> to emphasize the fact that the machine was color. So it's, they've uh, done their best uh, to render the Apple logo, but of course it doesn't work super well. Anyway, yeah, this is a cool one. This for me anyway was a game that I never I had never seen the original disc or package for because it always showed up on those you know when you when you trade discs with your friends and you get the ones that are just filled with like uh, um, the, the be runnable binaries that have been grabbed from the originals and stuffed on a, a floppy with a bunch of other ones. This was one like for me, you would boot it up and like, oh, there it is, number C and launch it. <laughs> um, but I did a, a Google search and it actually does have a package and it looks kind of cool. I didn't even know about that. So that's awesome. Yeah, that's so funny. It's so true. It's this is one of those games that it was a small game. So yeah, it was one of those ones that you know, if you've been pirating single disc access. Yeah, so, you know. if you'd been pirating games for a while, then you had twelve copies of it. You know, along with you know Crossfire and and uh, Lady Tut and a half dozen other games that just seem to be on every disc. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, Quinn. What did you pick? Well, my pick this month uh, is a game called Windwalker. And it's an origin game from uh, 1989 uh, by Greg Malone. And it's actually the sequel to an RPG called Mobius. And what I like about this game, Mobius was a, a deeply odd kind of thing. It was, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, it was an RPG uh, sort of in the traditional kind of Ultima style, but with a very unusual graphical style. And it was the kind of, kind of bold sort of thing to do for the time you know the the characters were all much larger than the terrain your characters were all these giant heads that moved around and it was the artwork was all the art style was all very kind of abstract so it said it, it's a sort of a vaguely asian theme non-specifically so uh lots of bamboo and and kung fu fighting and so on <laughs> probably yeah <laughs> probably insensitive in a number of ways but um What's neat about Windwalker is they took all of that uh, to the next level. And uh, the game, this is kind of from Origins 
glory days. You know, we've talked recently about uh, games like Knights of Legend or uh, some of those other really big production games that they were doing right at the very end of, of the Apple II's uh, 8-bit kind of life. And they were doing really impressive things graphically, really pushing the uh, sad little uh, high-res screen to, to new lengths. And this is one of those games it does that. I mean, it has a, a windowing system for, you know, for combat and uh, it does a lot of animation and a lot of really elaborate things. It's got some full screen, you know, vertical scrolling and just other things like that that are, you know, were previously thought probably not possible on the Apple II, eight bits at least. Uh, really great game, uh, you know, and it does, uh, it does some, it has one really weird mechanic that is probably why I chose it for this month. It uh, it has this stat called karma, and, and you know a common uh, tactic in these uh, you know old RPGs and like in any modern game as well is before you do something dangerous you save your game and then you do the dangerous thing and if it doesn't go well then you reload your save game and try again, and uh, or you just save periodically and then if something goes wrong you go back to your last save point. Very common tactic. Windwalker actually went out of its way to prevent you from doing that. So it had these things called karma points. And somehow, I'm not exactly sure the details, something to do with writing a file when the game started up or something, it would detect you doing that. And every time you attempted to do that, it would deduct a karma point. Oh, uh, jerks. Yeah, so you would reload your save and you would start playing and then you'd see the little karma bead tick over. And it was you had a limited number of these. And if you ran out of karma, then the game ended completely. And you had to restart from the very beginning with a new character. Really, really an interesting design in that way. And they were very clever about it because I, I remember trying a number of different ways to get around that feature. Uh, I tried, you know, removing <laughs> the disc, uh, you know, before quitting and uh, doing all, uh, re, you know, making copies of the disc before I saved and after I saved and swapping in copies at certain times. And I tried a bunch of things to try and circumvent this karma point system and I would never found a way to do it. So they really thought through the edge cases on this one when they programmed this feature. Uh, it's yeah, it's, it's it's really clever. It was heartbreaking to load your save and see that little karma bead tick over. I, I have this this vision in my head of of a young Quinn sitting in front of a screen trying these things <laughs> and a window of Wayne Knight popping up going ah, ah, ah every time you try one of these things. Yeah, it was not unlike that. Honestly, there was I just it was it was possibly scarring for my for my childhood because I distinctly remember <laughs> that moment of anticipation of seeing if this latest trick I had worked I had done would work and loading up my save game and then there was this little bit of a delay and then the karma bead would tick over <laughs> so uh, <laughs> yeah darn you Greg Malone of Origin Systems in 1989 you foiled all of my attempts to game your game uh, but yeah it's it, it is a really great game uh, it has uh, lots of great mechanics it's really deep lots of exploration visually stunning uh, it's got a cool uh, kung fu fighting mechanic uh, when you encounter enemies uh, so definitely definitely worth playing if you like this sort of game I, uh, I actually had Mobius because my friend bought it at the local Egghead software and played it for an hour and went, I don't know what this is. Do you want this? <laughs> and, and gave it to me. <laughs> and I, I had a little bit more luck figuring it out than he did, but it just it felt like such a weird experience. And that was a very strange time for, for Origin, uh, just in general, because I think, I think Richard Garriott was kind of trying to branch away from not, well, not move away from Ultima, but expand origins line so you had chuckles in there doing his uh you know the, the 2400 games and stuff like that and then you had these weird wind walkers experiments almost mm -hmm. so it's it's sort of neat to see because i i do remember hearing about this game and and i was interested until i found out that it was a sequel to mobius and i went oh i don't want that <laughs> uh so it's so it's nice to hear that it actually um there actually may be some merit to it and i should go check it out yeah it's definitely the the better of the two games uh you know yeah these early these early days of computer gaming development, they were really throwing everything at the wall to see what would stick. No one knew what was going to be a good idea, and there was no you know, established genres like we have now. Uh, so yeah, Mobius was a sort of a bold experiment that didn't quite work. It just ended up being kind of weird. It was interesting, but weird. Uh, but then Windwalker, I think they they kind of found the formula much more. Uh, hmm. So it's yeah, it's it's definitely worth playing. Uh, so yeah, of course we will uh, link to that in the show notes. It, it is playable in uh, virtual Apple in your browser. So I will uh, link to that in the show notes. And I think, awesome. yeah, and I think that wraps up weird gaming for this month. Uh, let's move on to tech. Fasten your seat bits and warm up your soldering irons. It's time to talk tech. 
All right, Quinn, what do we have in tech? Well, I wanted to just quickly talk about the uh, Apple II gamepad project that I uh, alluded to a couple of months ago, I believe. Yeah. yeah, so last time we talked about this, I had just a prototype on a breadboard going, and I linked to my blog about that. Uh, I have since come up with a uh, 3D printed uh, enclosure for it and some buttons and so on. And uh, so it's now a uh, fully working Apple II gamepad that is going to go in my bag with my 2C and get taken to Kansas Fest in three days. <laughs> uh, so uh, <laughs> yeah, so you, all, you all will have already seen this in person by the time you hear us talking yes, about it. Yes, that's the uh, anti-magic of radio i guess i, I don't know it's, <laughs> right. it's the magic of radio recorded radio the <laughs> magic of a monthly show the timing's all very strange <laughs> anyway uh yeah I, i'll be definitely be showing this around uh yeah my enclosure needs a little work it's uh, needs some fine tuning it's not super comfortable to hold but uh, it is a uh, functioning apple II gamepad with an analog stick and two buttons so lots of fun but uh, one of the, so I'll link to that again in the show notes so you can see the latest but the other reason i wanted to talk about this is uh, it occurred to me that this same technique that I used to build this gamepad could actually be used to repair old joysticks. Uh, one of the, as we all know, Apple II games are very joystick dependent. Um, most of them don't play very well without one. And these old joysticks are starting to fail because they have moving parts in them. And in particular, you know, they have these uh, carbon wiper style potentiometers in them, which are uh, all going to fail sooner or later. You know, there's, a, there's parts rubbing together specifically intentionally inside them, and that will always fail sooner or later. So they have a lifespan, and the potentiometers that were used were 150 ohms, uh, 150 k ohms, which is a very unusual size that nobody uses anymore. Uh, everything nowadays is just uh, magnitudes of of 10. So it's easy to find 1k, 10k, 100k, you know, one meg ohm uh, potentiometers, but these, yeah, 150 k is not uh, not something you can get anymore. Uh, so what you could do is uh, this trick that I talked about previously where you can add some capacitors into the circuit to fool the 555 timers inside the Apple II uh, into thinking there's more resistance in the joystick than there is. I uh, used that technique to use a modern um, compact joystick to work with the Apple II. What's cool about it though is that it's per axis. So if you have a joystick that has one axis that has gone bad, the form factor of the potentiometers inside has not changed. So you can still buy potentiometers of that exact physical dimension. They just have a different rating. So you could buy a 10K or 100K potentiometer and replace it and then add a couple of capacitors in the circuit there to um, make that just that axis look like the right value to the Apple II. So uh, you just have to do a little bit of math to figure out what size capacitor to put in there. And uh, I will link in the show notes to that math and the uh, circuit diagrams that you would need to affect a repair like this. So um, I guess, yes, yeah, again, too late to, to say this, but if you see me at Kansas Fest uh, and want to know how this is done, I can uh, show you in person. Or hopefully, uh, if you're listening to this, uh, you found me and I showed you because <laughs> you knew I was going to talk about this. And uh, it's a uh, monthly show, folks. Time, time makes no sense. Uh, okay. So anyway, that's, that, that's all I wanted to say about that. You can't see me right now, but I'm shaking my fist at physics mm. for, for having things wear down when they rub together. <laughs> yeah. You suck, physics. Yeah, it's funny. The joysticks are one of those few areas on these machines that really are not going to last forever. I mean, the machines themselves theoretically could last nearly forever because they have no moving parts in them and there's no you know sources of friction or anything. Thermal stress is about the only thing. And, of course, the capacitors that we talk about ad nauseum about the only things that can really fail in them uh, and the disk drives of course which we've handily replaced with solid state but the joysticks uh, are a definite weakness uh, so yeah they are absolutely going to to wear out every single one of them that uh, you have out there they're all time bombs so take good care of them and really if if you're if you're into apple II gaming and you you want a good experience with a game that requires a joystick like auto duel you, you just it's not the same doing it in emulation with a keyboard or a, a PC joystick, you really do need one of these, you know, the old craft Mach 2 joysticks to, to in, at least for me, for my buck, that's that's where I get the, the greatest experience playing it that way. Yeah, you really do. I mean, you have to remember these games were tuned for these old joysticks, you know, the, the acceleration curves and, and so on in, in the game controls were designed specifically for these joysticks. And so the, a lot of these games just really don't feel right with uh, with modern modern joysticks or in, in emulation. I personally don't play any games in Apple II emulators. I just, I don't find it satisfying at all. Uh, all of my gaming is done only on, on real hardware. Yep, mine too. All right, so I guess we're both snobs on uh, gaming and emulators. <laughs> 
Yes, you are objectively wrong if you play games in an emulator. <laughs> there I said That's it. That's right. You can, you can write in and, and tell us why we're wrong about that. What a transition I just made. <laughs> yeah, speaking of writing to us, if you uh, want to write to us, uh, our address, as always, is uh, feedback at open-apple.net. You can also use podcast at open-apple.net. So, Mike, let's talk to some people who have done that. Sounds good to me. You've listened to us talk. Now it's time to tell us what you think. All right. The first email I've got is from listener Alex. And Alex says, Mike and Quinn, I love the podcast and have been a dedicated listener since the first episode. Wow. Uh, now, technically, I'm assuming he's, he, he meant first episode. He actually wrote fist episode. So uh, <laughs> that could have been any of mine because I shake my fist a, whole a lot. A different show. context. <laughs> yeah, and Mike uh, Mike shakes his fist a lot. In fact, he did it this very episode. So hmm, it could have been any episode that he started listening. In any case, uh, we just talked about the Bard's Tale Four Kickstarter, and my, uh, Alex says I supported the Kickstarter project for Bard's Tale Four, uh, and uh, yeah, they notified their backers today that Burger Becky has been commissioned to update the original trilogy. So uh, that is a timely email. So thanks for that, Alex. And let's see, next up I've got uh, listener Jake who asks, uh, hi Quinn, huh, it's directed just at me, so there. Uh, oh, come on, you know they don't like me. <laughs> uh, I just get the ones, go away Mike, you suck. <laughs> That's why we call you the hate sponge. Uh, right. Jake says, hi Quinn, why aren't you on Twitter? Uh, yes, well... That is uh, a question I get asked a lot. And honestly, the short answer is because there's so many social networks and only so much time. So I kind of uh, hitched my wagon to the Facebook course a while ago and uh, can't quite bring myself to join another one. There just aren't enough hours in the day. Uh, but he links me to a tweet from Mr. Carrington Vanston, who listeners of this show will no doubt be familiar with, saying that Twitter needs more Quinn Dunkey. And uh, that's a, it's a lovely thought, but uh, I don't know if I agree. <laughs> Everything needs more Quinn. <laughs> Aw. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Next up, we've got an email from Antoine that you referenced earlier where he uh, refers to us as Mr. and Mrs. Podcast. Oh. Uh, I'm assuming I'm the Mrs. Podcast. I don't, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, could be a non-traditional marriage. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so he writes to tell us about the uh, Tool 221 that we talked about. So uh, thanks for that, Antoine. Uh, let's see. Next, I've got a letter from listener Warren who says, uh, Hi, guys. I rediscovered your podcast this year, uh, coinciding with getting a Bluetooth speaker for Christmas uh, so you can listen to podcasts while shaving in the morning. Uh, I have a Bluetooth speaker in my shower as well, so I can relate. It's the best thing ever. Uh, let's see. I have two remarks for you regarding the last few podcasts. Too many jokes. Too many jokes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, behave. Uh, let's see. Warren says, uh, I really enjoyed your Omega coverage, uh, though you forgot about one killer feature. Omega was one of my five favorite Apple II games, the others being Auto Duel, Elite, Archon, and Choplifter. That is an excellent list, sir. Bravo. Uh, but it was uh, Omega was unique in that it was multi-platform and that all of the tanks, AI coding, and arenas were transferable between platforms. And I don't think I actually knew that, in fact. Uh, that is fairly amazing. So it says, uh, recall the uh, heady late 80s when there wasn't truly a dominant computing platform. In my dorm, we had an Apple II 8-bit, the Apple II GS, Amiga, Atari ST, Atari 8-bit, C64, Mac Plus, Mac SE, and early PC-DOS platforms represented. Oh my god, that dorm sounds amazing. I wish I had been there. Uh, that was that last part was me. Uh, then he goes on to say, uh, Origin <laughs> Systems hosted a regular contest in which Omega players could upload their tanks to their BBS, and they would host contests pitting tanks against tanks. They recorded the action and made the recordings downloadable and also could be played back on all the platforms, so anyone could see how the fights, how the fights went. Uh, individual user tanks and playfields were downloadable as well. You could really experiment with different AI and tank designs, even if you were playing by yourself. Uh, says his dorm mates and I lost a solid four weeks of our lives programming tank after tank, and we named them after animals at the San Diego Zoo. Our best tank was the llama tank, and rather stupidly became a nickname that we still use with each other today. Uh, that's awesome, Warren. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, that's that's fantastic. I mean, I loved Omega already. I didn't know it also did all of that. Did, were you familiar with some of that, Mike? 
Uh, no, that's all beyond me, and, and just makes me want to go and play it even more. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if some of that is comes from again pirating these games versus buy, buying them. You know, for example. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, mm-hmm. for example, the fact that there was an Omega BBS where you could upload and share tanks, I had no idea, and I'm sure that was referenced in the manual, uh, which I would not have had, had access to for unspecified reasons. All right. <laughs> uh, the uh, the last email I've got here is from a listener, Ian, who uh, writes in about our uh, extra special episode with uh, John, Brooks, uh, John Brooks and uh, Matt Ownby. Ian says, uh, great interview with a genuine programming hero. He's got some pretty amazing memories and stuff. Uh, but of course, I'm going to have to nitpick. Uh, so in the interview, for anyone who doesn't know, John Brooks talked about the different um, types of three and a half inch drives for the GS and how he had to modify the uh, copy production in Rastan to work with the two different types of drives. Right. Uh, yeah. So Ian says, but of course I'm going to have to nitpick. There were actually three different three and a half inch external drives. The beige original that shipped with the 86 uh, Mac Plus, the white Unidisc 3.5 for the 2E2C, uh, and the Platinum 2GS Mac version, the Apple 3.5 drive. This last one is the one with the uh, with the integrated wa- in- integrated WAS machine controls low level because the 2GS is fast enough at 2.8 megahertz to handle it. Yeah, in fact, there's special circuitry in the 2C Plus for anyone who isn't familiar because it has that same kind of uh, dumb version of the uh, uni- uh, Unidisc, and so it needs special circuitry to be able to uh, run it. Uh, since it doesn't have the integrated 6502 that the earlier drives had. Uh, so uh, GSOS, oh, and he then goes on to say, uh, so John had also talked about how a lot of the special rendering tricks that they used in uh, Rastan to get the big sprites and the fast scrolling and all that were never used in uh, GSOS, and that always bothered him. Uh, but Ian goes on to say that GSOS in systems 5 and 6 actually did use a lot of the fast rendering paths that John was talking about. In particular, the 3.5-inch driver and QuickDraw 2 got significantly faster in System 5, and they improved things in 6 and 601. Uh, 601 can read every sector of a track in one disk rotation at peak throughput, for instance. Uh, John can be forgiven for not knowing that, since it appears he was doing uh, Super Nintendo development full-time by 91. That's cool. I didn't know that either. It's good to know that the uh, Apple engineers were uh, doing many of the same tricks as the demo coders by that point. Uh, as far as significant post-Rastan games on the 2GS, uh, he lists Out of This World. So yeah, that was also quite an amazing 2GS game. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, so thanks for mentioning that, Ian. Uh, that is uh, all the feedback that I've got. Did you come across any, Mike? No, um, AM or this, but I don't think that's really Apple II specific. All right. The, um, source code in a, in a character. Oh, yes. Yeah, that was actually kind of a nice article or a nice link. Uh, yeah, there was an article recently about there, there's this thing people are doing where they're writing uh, games that will fit in a tweet, 143 characters or whatever it is, and language is unspecified. So I guess, you know, Python or whatever your modern language of choice. Uh, but what's, yeah, what's funny about that is, of course, we were all doing that in the 80s with one-liners and two-liners in Applesoft Basic. And those uh, that was always my favorite uh, part of Beagle Brothers uh, media, you know, their advertisements and newsletters and so on, they often had one-liners and two-liners in them. Uh, and it was sort of magical because you'd, it was so compressed, you know, with using question mark for print and taking out all the white space. And so you never really knew what it was going to do until you ran it. Uh, so it was always really fun to type those in and see what happens. The article is on Boing Boing. And like Quinn mentions, it, it tends to stick to, oddly, more modern code, but uh, it, it's a fun read and, and a nice um, a nice harkening back there to the, the Beagle stuff. That's right. Way to go you, Quinn. <laughs> everything that's old is new again, or everything that's new is <laughs> old again, or everything that nothing's really new under the sun. I don't know. There's some tired cliches in there somewhere. And everything Apple II is Kansas fan. How's that? <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, on that note, uh, I think that about does it for this month. Am I right? Yeah, uh, that'll uh, wrap. Oh, I did want to did want to apologize for being two weeks late on the the June episode that was is going to appear mid July. <laughs> uh, the uh, I we I started a, a new job recently, which is why I will not be there. You will not see me there at Kansas Fest when you hear this voice. You will go, "Hey, I didn't see him there." That's right. <laughs> Uh, how did he know that? Uh, um, so I don't have, I just don't have the time to take anymore. If, if I, if I left, I would, it would be a week unpaid and, and I can't do that right now. But I did want to apologize that it took so long to get Tony's show up. We did have some editing issues, especially I think if you 
about what a third of the way or maybe two thirds of the way through the news section you can hear my source for some reason switch over to a different audio and my audio track on this for some reason went out of sync with with yours and Tony's so I kept having to cut two seconds here and slide and cut five seconds here which made like a, a two or three hour process turn it into about 12 or 13 hours and I was pulling my hair out and going no I want to die at the end of that so uh, but it's it, uh, I will be uh, posting that making that live here shortly actually probably right after we go off the air here and uh, we appreciate your patience we haven't gone away and um, have fun at Kansas Fest everybody I can't wait to read the reports yeah yeah this this that one that month was one of those ones where all the technical gremlins just lined up on the same day and everything went wrong that could go wrong so those of you who think podcasting is easy uh there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes and uh mike mike does most of it so next time you see him give him a big old cookie you will not see me uh but it can be easy you can just throw the audio up if you want but uh we like to maybe put out something that's a little more polished than that so that's what goes on there and again uh thanks for your patience for sure all right. Well, on that note, uh, let's wrap it up. Uh, it's been great uh, recording again this month. And thanks again to Lane for coming on the show. That was an awesome interview. One of, yeah, one of wow. my favorites She's amazing. that we've done. Yeah, she was just fantastic. When when we when we were bandying about her name uh, as a as a possible you know let's let's see if she'll come talk to us. There was a there was a, a moment where we thought well just, she's. 10 years younger than us. She doesn't have an Apple II. Is this, is this going to apply all that much? And yeah, it did. And <laughs> she's awesome. And thanks, Lane. We love you. Yeah, she crushed it. So, uh, all right. Well, uh, thanks for listening, everyone. And uh, we will see you next month. The cave itself was the idea came about and we talked with some museum people that do caves for museums. So they made it kind of authentic with authentic artifacts and things inside. And it's down here, it gets a little bit dark. That your head. The idea was that the kids would come and sit in the cave and you know have a fun day sitting around talking with each other, playing TV, whatever. So to get the rock structures to look like you're in a real cave and you're really going through some area that's almost, you know strange and dangerous and unknown. Um, we had a bunch of museum experts come in and work, work and work for a long time on that and embed things like um, like uh, shining crystals and in things and little fake artifacts like bones here and there. Um, the, so the, the structure, the coloring, everything is just um, pretty pretty amazing to have in a house. I mean it just goes, got different paths around all these columns of rock, of supposed rock, and we've got a, up there I've got a window to some natural light, it actually looks up into a koi pond, so when the koi are in it, you see the fish swimming around, that was my little bit crunch. This cave was part of a landscaping project that took, I think, a year and a half. I don't remember how long it took in all. This cave was being built throughout the project, I sort of came up with the idea, it started out with a little bit of space that was going to be under the landscaping, a little nook. And then I thought of a cave, and then we expanded it, expanded it, expanded it, and wound up being a huge project. And it's, uh, I like unusual things that aren't the normal. So, it is. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and it was great for, great for just kids. Yeah, I, I used to run, I used to run summer programs with tons of the local kids would come over to this house, and this is one of the areas. <laughs> There's lots more. Didn't want to make it too easy to find this cave. People walk around this backyard and they never even see the cave. The entrance is... We installed a rack of equipment here where the front of the rack is all inputs for wires and then the outputs go out to various jacks around the house that are all similar. It includes fiber optics to every room, includes ethernet for um, the, the internet to every room was inserted in a certain proper place the door would open and if the book wasn't there by one of these things are magnet sensors and if the magnet wasn't there if the book wasn't inserted properly the door wouldn't open <laughs> actually actually the snow was all out in the front area too where you, you drove up to the house. oh okay yeah. well you know everybody Snowman even thinks about the cave as having tunnels that go way out everybody in los Gatos. Yeah, they'll, they'll, yeah, they'll never know yeah they'll never know then it became a bedroom it has a full bath in it um down here 
is an entrance to, uh, I said, we're doing some of the construction projects on the house, adding bedrooms. I got this idea of would it be possible to have little secret pathways for kids? And this is what they came up with. Nice little decorative entrance, a little small door, kid-sized door. Go in there and then you would... This has been the Open Apple Podcast. Subscribe to us in iTunes or visit us at open-apple.net where you can browse our extensive catalogue of past episodes or read our blog. If you like what you've heard today, or even if you didn't, your comments, questions or ideas are always welcome. Send them to feedback at open-apple.net. Porn always sells.